right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome on behalf of the Department of Revenue's National Medicine Division. Uh, a reminder, as you just heard, we are recording this meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday. It's March 20th. It is 9.01 a.m. My name is Dominique Mendiola, and I serve as the Senior Director for the Colorado Department of Revenue's Natural Medicine Division. Uh, today, we are hosting our first rulemaking meeting as part of establishing a regulatory framework for regulated natural medicine here in Colorado. Um, our focus today will be on licensing and application requirements and procedures for those who want to operate or be employed by natural medicine facilities in the regulated space. I am joined by my co-chair, Allison Robinette, who is our Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs, as well as Amelia Myers, uh, our Senior Policy Advisor for the Natural Medicine Division. Um, additionally, Shannon Gray and Heather Draper, our communications team for the Natural Medicine Division, are here today and are um, our main points of contact for any media requests. We're also going to be joined by Ian Sieb, the Governor's Special Advisor on Cannabis and Natural Medicine, um, likely virtually. Um, and I understand we will have colleagues from the Department of Regulatory Agencies, DORA, our partner agency, um, as well as the Department of Public Health and Environment, who we work with very closely. Um, there are, uh, we have representatives there in attendance uh, today to support our discussions. Finally, from the Colorado Department of Law, we have Ross Hugerhide and Christy Di Maria um, here who represent the Natural Medicine Division. We also have Paige Olson, I understand, online, um, also with the Department of Law um, representing the Natural Medicine Division. We have three hours um, today set aside for our meeting to focus on subjects outlined in today's agenda. Uh, so if we hear any comments that are on subjects outside of the uh, agenda today, we may need to parking lot those items uh, and revisit them later, uh, recognizing we have, this is just the first meeting of our formal rulemaking process, so uh, a lot more to come. Um, also, we will be as it relates to fee setting. So fees, I, we recognize that that's likely on uh, folks' minds. Uh, we're looking to address fees in a separate and later rulemaking. Um, the purpose of this is for us to be able to use the feedback that we receive from uh, these work group meetings and all of our discussions to inform what those fees should look like. Um, this is because fees must reflect the direct and indirect costs of administering the program. So the details of those rules are really important to informing what that looks like. This separate fee setting rulemaking will similarly be uh, completed well before December 31st in order to make sure that we're giving interested applicants ample notice and opportunity to prepare for the application process and uh, for those required fees. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, our colleague Amelia to take us through the next steps. Great, so for those of you who've attended our listening sessions, we've highlighted changes in the law under Proposition 122 and Senate Bill 23290, which include personal use allowances and establishing a regulatory framework. The law, depart the law directs the Department of Regulatory Agencies, that's us, or no. that's our friends at online, DORA, to license and regulate facilitators, sorry, and persons approved by the state to administer natural medicine to adults in reg a regulated environment. And the law directs us, the Department of Revenue, to license and regulate healing centers, cultivations, manufacturers, and laboratory testing facilities. And the purpose of our rulemaking meeting today is to collaborate with stakeholders in establishing the regulatory framework for these natural medicine operations that will be re regulated by the Department of Revenue. And as Dominique noted as, at the start, this is our first rulemaking work group meeting, and the purpose of this meeting is to discuss draft rules related to definitions and application requirements. All meeting recordings and associated materials are accessible on our Natural Medicine Division website, including a summary of Senate Bill 2 290 we developed to support our implementation work. All right, so I'm going to take us through a few house, housekeeping matters before we start talking about the draft rules. So as a reminder, the meeting is being recorded, recordings are posted on our website, and we try to do that within 24 hours of the meeting. Last week, we distributed the agenda as well as draft rules that will guide our discussion today. We also have a few printed copies of the draft rules at the back of the room if anyone um, wants to look at them in person. And in your review prior to the meeting today, you saw areas of the rules that were highlighted in bright blue, 
which sometimes included additional context or background information about the rule or included questions that we're still looking um, for feedback and input on in order to further flesh out the rules. This is normal for our process and you can expect to see notes like this in the drafts that we produce um, for each of these meetings. But we welcome any feedback on any of the areas. So if you have not yet, please sign in at the back of the room um, or if you're online using our online form. On these sign-in sheets, you also can um, note whether you plan to make a comment today. And don't worry, we'll be um, asking folks to sign up for comments throughout the meeting today. So you have many opportunities, especially if you have multiple comments on different areas. If you're joining us online, please make sure that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. If you're here in person, we ask that you keep any side conversations to a minimum so that we can minimize feedback on the microphone for our virtual attendees. There are conference rooms across the hall, so if you do need to have a side conversation, we ask that you just step out into one of those conference rooms so that we're not disrupting our colleagues at the department around the corner. The chat in Zoom has been disabled, though you can still chat the meeting host if you have specific questions about how to, for example, sign up for comments. Please keep in mind that chats um, to meeting host and co-host are recorded as well. However, if you have comments or questions specifically about the rules that we're discussing, we ask you the, to make comments so that everyone else in the room can hear you and maybe that will resonate with someone else or, or trigger another thought for someone else as well. And we'll aim to take a break around 1030. So we'll just be watching our time so that we can all take a quick breather um, when it's appropriate. If you're interested in making comments on the material that we've outlined in our agenda, please either use that sign up short seat sheet online or in the back of the room. We will not be taking raised hands today. So you'll, you will need to sign up if you want to um, provide comments on the draft. When we open up the floor for public comment, we ask that you introduce yourself, including your name and any organization you may represent. If you're joining our Zoom meeting on the phone, you can mute and unmute um, using star six. And if needed, we may interrupt to ensure that people are stating their names just so it's easy for everyone to track. We will be limiting comments to three minutes today. We will be monitoring the queue to make sure we are reserving enough time um, as possible for anyone who wants to make comments. And of course, when we're touching on more than one subject as we often do, we will strive to accommodate individuals who sign up more than once for public comment. So if you hit your initial time limit and want more time to speak, please feel free to sign up for additional comments. All right, last little bit. During today's discussion of public comment period, we'd like to know whether you agree or disagree with the draft rule proposals, the reasons for your position, and any alternative approach we should consider to the extent you disagree with what we've included. Additionally, we ask participants to refrain from using this forum to promote products or services of any kind. Finally, as we've noted in our listening sessions, we appreciate the respect that every person has brought into these forums so please continue to be respectful of each other and this process. It is required by the law and it's beneficial to the, to the Natural Medicine Division to have varied and differing views and perspectives and to hear all of those perspectives. So, that we, so we ask that participants remain courteous throughout the discussions today. With that, I'll hand it back over to Dominique. All right, thank you. And just to um, first hit on some of the things that Allison just covered with the, the logistics here. Um, as we, you know, recognizing we've held 11 <coughs> listening sessions, public listening sessions, so this is where you're seeing that shift uh, to the more formal rulemaking process, even when it comes to our environment, our layout here, um, where the environment is a bit different and the formalities are a bit different, where in the listening sessions we were um, looking at raised hands for folks who want to have comment to just support that open dialogue there and just want to touch on the why behind why, for example, we're asking folks to you really need to sign up in order to provide public comment. That is so that we are ensuring we're complying with the, uh, with areas of the law. And this is specifically the Colorado Administrative Procedure Act, which directs our rulemaking process. We need to compile a rulemaking record that is ultimately going to go to the state licensing authority who's adopting those rules. Uh, where we are proposing rules, we're engaging in this dialogue, making sure that we're collaborating with stakeholders in this process. But ultimately everything that we're engaging in here, the comments we're receiving, it's really critical that we are, we're doing what, uh, what we need to to comply with legal requirements um, related to that rulemaking process. So 
that is why you'll hear there's some of that extra formality around what we need from you in order to be able to make public comment. Um, so we welcome any questions around this as well to make sure that you will understand why you're seeing some of that shifts from how we've conducted listening sessions that were uh, more informal to this formal rulemaking process. Um, also, Allison had mentioned um, when folks are speaking up, we want to make sure that you are um, stating, even if you're speaking up, if you're signing up multiple times, um, that you're stating your name and, and also who you represent. If you're speaking on behalf of an organization or you're speaking on behalf of yourself, um, that's important for us as well for the rulemaking record. So if you don't do that, you may um, hear us interrupt you just so that you can, uh, we can reinforce that expectation for the rule record. Um, all right, so as we begin our rulemaking necessary to stand up a new regulatory program for natural medicine in Colorado, we think it's helpful to look at established principles um, that we have historically used to guide our department's rulemaking, um, particularly reflecting on how we've approached our rulemaking in the cannabis space. Um, we believe the same guiding principles um, remain applicable here and can inform an effective approach to our engagement with stakeholders um, in this rulemaking process for natural medicine. These four principles should guide our rulemaking work and engagements. So that includes um, the rules should be transparent and that rules clearly communicate expectations of licensees. Rules should be systematic, meaning compliance can be planned and carried out. Rules should be operable, such that licensees can reasonably integrate rule requirements into their process. Um, and so the division can appropriately monitor and determine compliance. Finally, rules should be defensible and that they're grounded in law. So that's where we're gonna be going back to statutory requirements. What does the original um, measure provide as well as uh, Senate Bill 290 that is directing the work that we're doing here. So that's where uh, we're seeing the importance of rules being defensible. So as a reminder, we're going to be talking about three different topics, um, taking comments for those sections and then moving to the next topic. This detailed agenda um, that we provided outlines how we'll, we, we will be proceeding uh, with presenting a group of rules um, and accepting public comment before we move on to the next um, topic and next set of rules. Please remember to sign up again as noted um, using either the online sign up form or the form at the back of the room. Um, and we'll be taking comments in the order that folks are signing up. And I know we're gonna include a link in the chat. Um, so I'm going to get us started by presenting our first set of rules that we're going to look at, and then we'll do a public comment after that. The first section we're going to discuss today are the general requirements, definitions, and the application processes of the proposed regulations. So we're looking at rules 1005 through 1025 in section one, as well as in section two, two rules 2105, 2110, 2155, and 2160. I'm going to start us out with rule 1005 on page one, and it provides that the full set of rules will apply to any person who wishes to operate a facility for the purpose of cultivation, manufacturing, testing, storage, distribution, transport, transfer, and dispensation of regulated natural medicine. This rule also includes expectations that all licensees will comply with any applicable public health or executive orders. And this language is more standard across regulatory agencies and programs and a lesson we learned from our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, where it's better to proactively have these expectations in place to reduce confusion if or when a public health or executive order is issued. Next, we're going to rule 1010 on page one. It's also standard language to provide applicants and licensees clarity that if one rule for some reason is invalid, the remaining rules will stay in effect. Then on to rule 1015 on pages two through the top of page four provides that the process for any interested person to submit a request for a position statement or request for declaratory order. These processes as outlined in the draft rule, mirror the processes we've established in the Colorado marijuana rules. They're substantially similar to the Colorado liquor rules and are consistent with the State Administrative Procedure Act. A statement of position is a process through which a person requests the division to give an opinion on how a statute or rule affects that person. 
The division has discretion to provide a position position statement and will respond to the requester in writing in either the position statement or a notice declining to issue a statement. A declaratory order, on the other hand, is a request to the state licensing authority after the division has either issued a position statement within the previous 30 days or at any time if the division does not respond, either with a statement or notice declining to issue a statement within 60 days. And finally, all position statements and declaratory orders will be published on the division's website and available for anyone from the public to review. Next, Rule 1020 on page four clarifies that nothing in the natural medicine code or the rules we're developing now limit the ability of state and local law enforcement agencies to investigate unlawful activity. So as a reminder, while the personal use provisions of Proposition 122 and Senate Bill 290 are currently effective, there remain some criminal offenses in Title 18. So it's important we're all clear the regulatory authority we at the Department of Revenue have and how that authority is different from law enforcement authority to enforce criminal laws. We'll now shift to discussing the proposed definitions in Rule 1025 on pages four through six. Um, please keep in mind that as we continue to draft the rules, the definition section will be updated with new terms. So this section is not an exhaustive list right now. The terms we've included are specific for today's discussion. A lot of the defined terms you see here are pulled directly from statute at section 4450.103, including facilitator, healing center, license, licensee, local jurisdiction, natural medicine business, regulated natural medicine, regulated natural medicine product, and state licensing authority. Because these terms are defined in the law, we do not have the ability to change those definitions. In addition to the terms defined in statute that are important for reading and complying with the rules, we'll be adding defined terms that are necessary to clearly communicate in the rules. Um, so in this vein, you'll see proposed definitions for a community impact plan, an employee license, a final agency order, financial interest, natural medicine cultivation facility, natural products, medicine products manufacturer, owner, and testing facility. Specifically, the proposed definition of community impact plan pulls language from Senate Bill 23290 to help inform how we're thinking about these plans in the context of the rules, which we will be discussing in more depth later in today's meeting. The proposed definition for financial interest will work in tandem with the rules we'll be discussing today as well. Our objective in this definition is to set the outer guardrails around what a financial interest is with more substantive requirements and guidance built out in the rule 2140 that we'll get to more after our first round of public comments. And the proposed definition of owner aligns with the mandatory rulemaking directed in the natural medicine code. As noted in the draft rules in blue highlighted text, this first draft of the rules do not address the potential for publicly traded company ownership in a natural medicine facility. So this is an area that we are looking for feedback on for purposes of both the substantive rules and the definitions. So when we get to our first public comment opportunity this morning, we welcome your input on the specific definitions and urge anyone who's looking to share comments on the substance of how these terms are used to wait until we get to those specific rules in part two. With those terms in mind, Allison is going to shift us now to looking at the general application requirements in rules 2105, 2110, 2125, 2130, 2155, and 2160. Great, thanks. So turning to those rules, we're gonna start at rule 2105. That's um, at the bottom of page six and continuing on to page seven. There are three primary duties of all applicants and licensees laid out in this rule, which include the duty to keep a current mailing address on file with the division, and this is important so that we can make sure notifications required by law are sent to the correct address. This rule also includes the duty to cooperate with division staff because we can only carry out our responsibilities if licensees collaborate and cooperate with us. Uh, next, we'll turn to rule 2110 on pages seven and eight. Our goal is to keep the application process as simple as possible while following the National Medicine Code to ensure safe access to regulated natural medicine at licensed healing centers. To that end, we will require applicants to truthfully complete required divisions forms and submit the required fees. 
As Dominique mentioned earlier, we are not discussing specific fees in this rulemaking. In Rule 2125 on pages 10 through 12, you'll see the beginning draft of what to expect are natural medicine facility applications. In paragraph A of this rule, each application must include information about each proposed owner. This is necessary because of the prohibition uh, in the Natural Medicine Code restricting the number of licenses someone may have a financial interest in. Additionally, this rule contemplates that information is required if an applicant has formed an LLC or other entity that they are looking to hold the license. And in paragraph A on page 11, we've included requirements laid out in statute regarding possession of a licensed premises and where that proposed licensed premises may be located. Similarly, we are required by the code to confirm that the application is compliant with any tax requirements. Following these initial requirements that are mandated in the Natural Medicine Code, we've included a few placeholders noting that we will be exploring additional application requirements specific to each license type in future rulemaking meetings. Part of the reason we wanted to include these placeholders is so our stakeholders know that these are areas that we are continuing to develop throughout this process and we encourage folks to proactively think about what requirements they would like to see in rule or think would be, re would be reasonable. And we'd love to see written comments um, on these topics leading to our future work group meetings so we can build those comments into the draft rules. Moving to rule 2130 on pages 13 through 16, we've outlined the requirements and expectations for the license renewal process. This rule applies to all licenses and includes some more specific requirements as needed. We are starting with annual renewal expectations. So each license would be valid for one year. While the code does not specify the length of time a license is valid, uh, it, this varies across the state and across programs. And so we are starting here with a one year license period for initial implementation purposes. This annual touch point with new licensees gives us more opportunity to support compliant operations. And it also helps us get a clearer picture of the license population to assess how the licensing process is working and what might need to be approved. And this will also help us identify and address any compliance trends that we see. Additionally, we are a cash funded program and are required to use application license fees to fund and maintain the direct and indirect costs of the regulatory program. With this in mind, we think annual renewals will help us get a better handle on the cash fund and ensure we're able to maintain operations to fulfill our statutory requirements. The rule also provides a process for license reinstatement in the event that a license expires before it is renewed. This is a process we've established in the marijuana regulatory space and have seen the real value in clear, simple process with guardrails and restrictions that allows a facility to reinstate their license. The reinstatement process is contemplated as only available for facilities or business licenses at this point. And this is because a, the number of employee and owner licensees expected to be much higher than the number of facilities and the workload associated with the reinstatement process is not minimal. So we would like to start with a more narrow allowance and we'll have opportunities to reevaluate the scope of the reinstatement process after we've seen a few renewal processes. The last piece I'll highlight in this rule is in paragraph H where we spell out what documents a natural medicine business licensee will be expected to submit with their renewal application. Again, these requirements are consistent with the Natural Medicine Code requirements. Only two more. So in Rule 2155 on page 20, we are addressing the scenarios of application denial, voluntary withdrawal of an application, and effect of a license surrender. These processes, as outlined in the rule, serve to set expectations and provide clarity to licensees so they can more easily navigate the application process. In some circumstances, an applicant may decide to withdraw their application, and in other instances, the division may deny an application. So the purpose of this rule is to really give applicants a roadmap and to direct folks to more specific processes that we'll be developing and discussing at future work group meetings. Rule 2160 on pages 21 and 22 covers the requirements from the Natural Medicine Code that ensures that all natural medicine businesses must have at least 
one owner licensee and each healing center must also employ or contract with a facilitator in order to operate. And I want to call out here on page 21, you may see a reference to a controlling beneficial owner that looks like it should be a defined term. This is an error in the draft that we circulated. We do not intend to define or otherwise contemplate controlling beneficial owners in these rules. So that was a lot of information to take in. That's um, everything that we'll start with our first public comment period. And I'd like to look to our AG team or other natural medicine te division team members if they have anything to add before we open up for public comment. Um, I have a couple of things just wanted to hit on and based on what you just covered here and also recognizing we've had some additional attendees really appreciate the in-person presence and, and presence online. Um, this is great when we're thinking about continuing to provide an environment for this hybrid um, engagement and how we're accommodating folks across the state who want to be a part of this, but also those who want to be here in person, recognizing that there are some travel limitations for folks. So, you know, this, this is really what we're looking for. So thank you for being here. Um, we, as mentioned earlier, we do have a couple of um, copies of the proposed rules that are in the back just for um, access purposes. If you didn't bring a copy or if you didn't have, if you don't have your computer in front of you to be able to look at that. Um, so, so take advantage of that. And also we're looking uh, for folks who are interested in making public comment, unlike our listening sessions where we were just going with raised hands, we uh, are really needing you to sign up for public comment if you'd like to make comments. So please do that if you want to, um, to, to make a statement today. So first, um, Allison had touched on, uh, or uh, Amelia, on the position statement request process. This is something that's pretty common for our agencies is having a, a process in place for, um, for uh, an individual who is looking to understand the division's position on a particular subject. And so that's the basis for it. Um, and just is it might be helpful uh, recognizing other agencies, divisions have a process like this in place. This is something that we have had in place within the Marijuana Enforcement Division. So if you would like to see an example of what that looks like and, and how we respond to certain questions and, and also provide context around, for example, why we might not see it as appropriate to issue a position statement on a certain thing, um, on a certain topic, that we will have that documented as our response and explain that. And that's published on our website for the Marijuana Enforcement Division. Similarly, if we see that this falls into what is appropriate as a position statement uh, to address an, as a position statement for the division, um, that is something that also you will see as an example um, on, online with the Marijuana Enforcement Division. So it may just be helpful to get some context around what we're talking about and see some examples if it's something you'd like to see. I don't know if there might be an opportunity for our team to include a link to that section of the MEDs, like page for position statements, just so folks can see what we're really talking about there. Um, also, uh, when it comes to certain rule topics that you see reflected in the proposed rules, um, the feedback that we're welcoming here also includes whether we should even maintain um, a proposed rule on something, and then we can assess why we have this rule in place. Is it something that's directed by statute to address this topic? Or if not, do we need it right now? Is it something that you know, for simplification purposes, maybe we don't need to address in this first round of rulemaking. An example there being the reinstatement process. If, if a um, operation, if a facility license um, expires and there's a window of time, as you can see in the proposed rules to be able to say, I want to have this reinstated, I didn't um, renew in time, is that necessary in this first round? Consider that it's informed by other experience that we've seen in other areas like the cannabis space. So um, it's looking to try to get ahead of those types of issues, but also want to make sure that the feedback we're hearing from you includes whether you see that as something that should be a part of this initial round of rules. Um, we will also, um, as a part of our um, implementation work, um, be creating applications. So we're going to we're going to be drafting. Uh, applications and what that looks like. And we, what we want to do as a part of this is bring those to the table too, like it's draft applications to get input from stakeholders. So just a heads up on that um, beyond just the rules that outline that application process. Um, and also just when it comes to written comments, we want to reinforce the value of written comments. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you today, um, but also, um, please take advantage of, even if you've made a statement today, of that written comment process. I will say just from um, my 
nearly 10 years experience at the Department of Revenue so far, we have oftentimes when we get written comments and it includes if there's an issue that you all see and have feedback on about a proposed rule, how would you suggest changing it? What, what, what's the alternative that you would suggest? And there are many um, moments that we have taken your proposal verbatim and that is the rule that ends up getting adopted. So one to encourage that if you're identifying an issue and have a strong opinion about something, we'd love to hear how you would change the content of that rule because that can really inform what that final rule looks like. I'll leave it there, thank you. Uh, I just wanted, uh, you had mentioned the, uh, Shannon Gray, sorry, uh, Natural Medicine Division, you'd mentioned the uh, physical copies surrounded, I just, uh, surrounding in the room. For those joining us online and those who have their computers, I just wanted to mention that the Natural Medicine Division website has all the materials for today's rulemaking, as well as any future rulemakings. Um, and so that uh, website is dnm.colorado.gov forward slash rulemaking. You'll have all the uh, draft rules there, the agendas, um, and any other applicable materials for rulemaking going forward, as well as a public resources folder that help houses all those materials. And we will have the recordings of these meetings within 24 hours uh, posted to that uh, site after uh, the meetings conclude. So if you wanted to revisit uh, the meeting recordings, you could be able to do that. And also wanted to just um, encourage those who have not signed up for our stakeholder notifications to do so. That is on the homepage for the Natural Medicine Division. And then you'll receive all these materials proactively in your inbox. Yeah, wonderful. And online, they're dropping links to all of these resources for in-person folks. We have business cards on the back table that have a QR code that take you directly to our website. Okay, so we are going to start with public comment. We'll be shifting between virtual attendees and in-person attendees. And we realized after we asked you all to sign in that it doesn't actually give you a chance to say, I would like to make a public comment. So um, what we'll, we'll call an audible here. And if you're in the per in room and would like to make a comment, we'll do a few online and then we'll ask for hands and call folks up to give their comments at the table up here at the front. So sorry about that. We'll start online with Robert H. Oh, yes, ma'am. This is uh, Robert Hansen. Um, I am just kind of interested in this new uh, field. And so I was just wondering, um, so what kind of license type would be required um, of, and is uh, the division interested in ever allowing like, uh, like a psilocybin uh, delivery service? for people that are maybe homebound or people that are uh, maybe in like such a severe depression that they literally just don't even want to go outside of the house. And um, if so, what kind of guidance would you have for, for somebody interested in that area? Thank you, Robert, for your comment and your question. And um, it's a good opportunity to highlight a reminder that the Natural Medicine Code does not contemplate this being a commercial model, and so there will not be um, sales of natural medicine, and administration sessions are expected to um, happen, at least in the regulated space, within licensed healing centers. And so at this point, we haven't started contemplating delivery of natural medicine, although um, as Amelia outlined in the presentation, we do have authority within the Department of Revenue for other licenses, for example, for the transport of natural medicine, but that would be transport between facilities. And so um, we fully expect to have those conversations about what other license types may be appropriate beyond the four that are uh, mandated in the code and appreciate any um, written comments you wanna uh, submit about what, what those other license types may include. Thanks, and yeah, while we're looking to tee up our next speaker, um, we'll also hit on another portion of the question from Robert is that the types of licenses that we're issuing um, from the Department of Revenue. And so that includes healing centers where the um, administration of natural medicine can occur by a facilitator um, in this more therapeutic setting to, to touch on what Allison just hit uh, around the fact that this is not, you know, unlike the, the cannabis program we have here, it's not a commercial sale type program um, where in, in this case, um, this is uh, providing a space, a regulated space where um, participants, uh, adults 21 and up um, want to have an experience with a, a facilitator and that facilitator is licensed by the Department of Regulatory Agencies, our partners at DORA. 
Um, and the healing center is a space where that administration of natural medicine can occur. Um, there is some allowance in the law for facilitators to provide um, regulated um, services, administration of natural medicine in other locations, and that is still getting worked out through the rulemaking process of what that could look like. Um, we are also, from the Department of Revenue, um, going to be uh, licensing cultivation um, licenses and manufacturing facilities. Um, and testing facilities, so for laboratory testing purposes. Um, so wanted to touch on that and agree just as it relates to the delivery service that's not um, contemplated under the law um, at this stage. And so I uh, appreciate that clarification. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies. And uh, yeah, just to clarify too, uh, you know, definitely not interested in any commercial type thing. I do believe in the power of natural medicine as um, a prior patient myself. I, I see in the relief that it provides uh, people like me from severe anxiety and stuff like that. So my purpose would be to educate patients and people that are interested in um, uh, trying psilocybin and offering pretty much support services, but definitely not interested in, obviously we can't sell psilocybin. So that's, that's, that's not our plan. Great. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next we'll go to Isham Lopez. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name online. Hello, good morning. Uh, yeah, I was just, um, I'm a mycology enthusiast, so I was just wondering how the the licenses work for cultivation as well. Um, will we see that in the future where people usually have uh, home kits? Um, the hydroponics usually have self substrate already. So how, how would be in the clear to do that at home would be my question. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so want to recognize that there are personal use provisions that are currently effective in Senate Bill 290, and that includes the personal cultivation in a um, closed and locked space that is no larger than 12 feet by 12 feet. There will also be cultivation licenses, as we've discussed, and the more specific um, sort of expectations around those practices and requirements we will be having at a work group meeting, I believe on June 12th, but um, I will confirm that, but we'll, we'll be talking about cultivation specific requirements at a future work group meeting. This is really, um, really just to lay that groundwork and framework for application processes. Great, yeah, and this is Dominique with the Natural Medicine Division. And just to confirm, we do have that as marked as meeting number five, where we are covering uh, cultivation and manufacturing requirements um, on June 12th, and that's from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and that's virtual only. Thank you. And I apologize, everyone. I asked you all to introduce yourselves and say your organization, and I've been failing to do that. Allison Robinette, Natural Medicine Division. All right, we will go next. One more online comment, and then we'll come in person for comments to um, Joseph Caruso online. Hi, uh, Joseph Caruso. I'm representing myself as a resident and then someone who's interested in getting a manufacturing license. Uh, just for the definitions, I think we might want to add something to the effect of uh, what a permanent Colorado resident would be as we're looking at some of this ownership structure uh, stuff in the future, uh, you know, later in there. I think we also might want to add on the regulated natural medicine it says only psilocybin and psilocin we might want to have a placeholder later for uh, future compounds and then uh, this might be controversial as well but i think they might want to add a definition potentially for what a colorado born native uh what the definition of what that would be just in uh some opinions on priority review and that's uh all i have thank you thank you all right, thank you. And as I mentioned, our in-person sign-up sheets did not actually include a note um, if you were looking to sign up for comments. So if we could just see a quick raise of hands, anyone who wants to make a comment, yes, please come ahead. Um, we'll have two people sit up at the table to take turns making comments. Come on up, come on down. Yeah, come on down. Yes, please come down. We'll take three comments. Um, well, let's do four since we have two spots and then we'll go back online. Charity with Colorado Teletherapy Services. 
Thanks for giving us a chance to speak today. Um, I had two questions. The first one is on page 10, um, section 2125 under basis and purpose. There was a question regarding recommendations for license consolidation. And I wanted to make a recommendation that cultivation and manufacturing be consolidated as an option into one license. That would make a lot of sense that in order to manufacture, you're gonna need product. And most people that have the knowledge to really grow in a really substantial way would also have knowledge about how to manufacture for various opportunities. Um, I had also marked cultivation healing center, but in kind of talking out loud and thinking back on that, that could make sense on one hand, but then there are some healing center owners who likely will not have the knowledge to really provide quality product for cultivation. Um, so that might be questionable of what's going out to the general, excuse me, general public. Um, it would also take away from the licensed growers, um, cultivators, as far as their whole goal is being able to extend that product to the healing centers. So I did have a question as well in that I noticed that the uh, growers can only, or cultivators can only, um, I guess, sell to other licensed facilities. So licensed healing centers and manufacturers, I guess that would be. And so my question on that would be any religious institutions that use products ceremonially, is that going to be covered? may or may not have an answer to that yet, but just wanted to put that out there. And then my last second half of my three minutes, um, page 11, section 2125, natural medicine license, um, number two, and then letter C, talks about the licensed premises being at least a thousand feet away from a child care facility and a list of educational institutions. Question there about churches that provide daycare um, or half day programs. Is there a time period? Because or from Carter Springs, there's pretty much a church on every corner down there. So to be away from both educational institutions and religious facilities can provide some challenge. And then understanding a little bit about where to find the local zoning jurisdiction laws. Um, it's one thing to say, okay, the state says this. Again, Carter Springs is a very conservative town. So I know that there's been a lot of regulation regarding the marijuana industry down there. Uh, for instance, Marijuana uh, distributors could not be near churches because of the odor of the product. Obviously, psilocybin doesn't have an odor like that, but just kind of some direction on where to go to find that information. So that was it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Skip Metter. Millie and I have uh, spoken, uh, yeah, just going over how this is unfolding here. Um, <clears throat> Been in the cannabis space since 2009. I've uh, done just about everything you can do in that space. Growing cannabis, owning a dispensary, having a lab kitchen. I still have a products company going and uh, really focusing on formulations and getting into testing and actives and dosing, right? If there's one thing I've seen on the cannabis side, you know, in that case being a whole plant extract, uh, and seeing how hemp has unfolded. You have all these things that are, that are actives, right? In the pharmaceutical world, they call them APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. When I look at this world, you know, what actives are we really focusing on for one? Um, testing of those actives and in what forms those will be delivered in. So rather than just a, a raw, you know, a, a fruiting top, right? Can it be in a liquid form? What, what, what's, a, what's a dose that people can uh, measure and, and maintain? And can the labs test for that, right? And that's the one thing I've seen with cannabis just through the years still is what is a dose? Especially since you're starting it therapeutically and medically, there needs to be some basis for that, right? Uh, as these um, different forms come online, you're gonna have uh, different potencies, right? So though a gram of a fruiting top may look the same, it could have twice the psilocybin or some other active component that you should be addressing, right? Um, so I have some amazing <laughs> growers out there. I mean, all this starts uh, behind the scenes and then comes online. And these are the initial experts in that realm. But with all of this, they, they've been limited by what they could test for, right? And they may not be aware of that or even just what, what is present in the potential there, right? 
So I just want to see what their regulations, how they focus on that testing component, and what access do these uh, does everyone have to be able to test on a level playing field and, and having a dose established, right? I think that's that's just kind of a bright shining thing that I see that should be addressed sooner than later. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. Thank right. you. Um, a couple of comments while we're looking to tee up some other folks here um, and welcome to come in and you can stand or sit, whatever is most comfortable to you. Um, and also making sure that if you are coming up, um, you know, confirming that you have signed up as well and we'll look to update our sign in sheet going forward um, so that it's easier for us to confirm um, who's looking to, to speak today. Um, a couple of comments uh, initially is just with the testing related provisions. That's something I expect we will be diving into more in future in some of the upcoming um, work group meetings. So um, products that um, could be available through manufacturing facilities license. It's making sure that we are assessing what can actually be um, tested uh, by laboratories in this space. So that is something that is top of mind. And um, there, and also the uh, discussions around uh, consolidating licenses are really more what we, I imagine, would envision is still seeing these as separate license categories. But if there's a co-location um, opportunity, then that is helpful to see to understand where there's interest in somebody who wants to um, have two different license types that are co-located. That is an example of what informs our later rulemaking on fee setting. Um, where there may be efficiencies that come with the co-location um, element that will inform how do, how do fees look related to this when it comes to the work that we're doing, inspections or investigations, that engagement with licensees, um, outreach education, um, where there are efficiencies that come with that. So that's an important for us to be considering. Please, Darren. Sure. My name is Darren Lyman. I'm here, I guess, on my own account. Uh, I would suggest another license, uh, maybe a co-op license. Uh, I'm going to be operating in the spot between uh, the growers and uh, educating people in how to grow uh, their own at home. Um, and then also uh, facilitating, um, I guess, uh, the natural medicine uh, as well uh, on a community. So I guess just to, that that being said, uh, I'm not sure how I can state it more without doing a promotion. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. More of a co-op, uh, nonprofit, uh, education based. And if you want, we can talk more and discuss that in further. Thank you. My name's uh, Mark Andrews, and uh, you, you can you can still come up as if you want to. Yeah, I'll be quick. I think, hi everyone, my name is Courtney Barnes. I'm an attorney who is representing businesses that are interested in seeking licensure. I think you will make, have the answer to this question. I just wanted clarity. Is it only healing centers that are subject to the thousand foot setbacks from schools and other locations or is it all licensed types? And that's my question. Well, appreciate that question. Um, yes, in the code, it's healing centers specifically that are required to comply with the 1,000 foot setback, but local jurisdictions have the ability to put um, additional zoning restrictions in place for the other license types. So in statute, the one that we'll be looking at is specific to healing centers. Great, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. My name is Mark Andrews, and uh, I'm just a registered nurse. And my question is specifically about facilitator status uh, are is the facilitator taking direct responsibility and care for the patient like when i work as a nurse i take care or will care of my patients when i take on report and their their, their health and wellness is my responsibility while i'm on shift now is a facilitator taking on the responsibility of that person's health and wellness and if so do we have to be under the direction of the licensed provider in case we do have a code, do we have to have AEDs available? Do we have to have ACLS procedures in place? Things like that. Is any of that been really taken into consideration or is it just not really yet? I mean, are they, is it considered an inpatient forum or is it considered an outpatient treatment or is it just a provision of natural medicine? That, that's kind of like where I'm worried about. And 
if I become a facilitator and as a registered nurse, I had to swear an oath and when we make my license there to do no harm, of course, I don't want to do any harm with this facilitator, but if something happens, am I at risk of losing my registered nurse license? I'm sure most PAs and MPs and MDs and DOs are in the same boat. Uh, duality of licensure, are we under uh, direction of both both of our licenses at the same time as we're operating as a facilitator or are we just strictly operating as a facilitator? And with the extensive extension, like uh, if I came across a car accident on the highway, I fall under the Good Samaritan Act by helping. And I don't fall under as a registered nurse, I'm not held to that higher standard because I'm helping. So how, how is the, I don't know if Dora's gonna do that or natural medicine is gonna be involved in that way making or how's that going to fall out? Sure. I appreciate the comment and question on this and, and do see this as um, uh, appropriate as in within scope of the work that um, our partners at DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, what they're working through, recognizing there is a um, appointed uh, membership of natural medicine advisory board members um, who are also engaging in conversations around things like this. And that's informing recommendations for rules uh, to DORA and to us um, and the Department of Revenue as it relates to the scope of what facilitators um, uh, are doing, what the expectations are of facilitators and procedures associated with that. Um, imagine that those would be um, appropriately placed within DORA's scope, but I think it's just, it's a helpful comment for our, our partners at DORA, who I understand are listening in, to just know that that's a question that um, there is interest in getting some more clarity around, as DORA is, in addition to both the Natural Medicine Advisory Board meetings that are ongoing, um, they're also engaging in a separate rulemaking process, and so with that, imagine that those types of questions will come up and get flushed out further um, in that process. Yeah, and I wanted to add to, I agree, this is very helpful. And um, while our partners at DORA will be handling the licensing and regulating of facilitators, what we're going to get into in our next section, we'll talk about how other folks who may not be licensed as a facilitator um, may engage in the regulatory space that Department of Revenue is licensing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're going to shift back to some online comments and we'll go to Michaela Vogt. Vogt, sorry. Hi, yes, I just had um, two questions slash comments. My first is um, wondering if the owner licensee of a healing center can be the same person as the contracted facilitator for that center. And then my second question regards center licensing or healing center licensing for individuals in private practice. Um, if we are running a private practice and we're renting space from a building or whatever, how do we go about getting, do we have to work with the, the, the building that we're renting from in order to get the locations licensed as a healing center, or is that something the private practice can do within a location? Um, or is there, I know in the recommendations process, we had talked about a special permit um, specifically for those doing um, facilitation for individuals who might be homebound, for instance, like hospice settings, and wondering maybe if that would apply in this setting for a private practitioner working out of their own private office. Thank you, Michaela. So I know you had a few questions in there. Um, I did want to note that for purposes of the application process for a facility, for example, a healing center, um, the proposed rules right now suggest that the applicant will have to ha um, demonstrate in the process that they have possession or are entitled to possession of the proposed premises. This could include a lease. And so um, while we can't give legal advice about what is in that lease, that's what we would expect to see in the application to say, um, here is my lease. And this is how I'm demonstrating that I will be in possession of the premises that I seek to operate a healing center out of. And then your first question uh, was regarding whether a facilitator can also be an owner of a facility. And that answer is yes, which we will get into here in a moment. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. 
All right, we will now go to Nico Skibaska. And then we'll Hello. take, yeah, go ahead, Nico. Thank you. Um, this is Nico Skivaski. I'm a healthcare data expert from Althea Public Benefit and affiliated with CU School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry at Anschutz. Um, my comments pertain not necessarily to the content of the required information to be collected and submitted by applicants and license holders, but really to the methods in which the information is collected. So from my understanding, the purpose of collecting information around this program is to measure the impact uh, including safety and diversion, and to learn for, uh, to really learn for the future of um, policy uh, to drive the efficacy of natural medicine in our society, and so to that end, I uh, support the efforts. Uh, but how, really, the um, these requirements though will introduce some challenges for interested parties. Um, for instance, how will we ensure that the data that's collected is secure and protects the sensitive private data uh, from falling into the wrong hands? And will, license, will licensees be compelled to keep their own records using whatever methods uh, that are convenient to them, like spreadsheets or filing cabinets? Um, how will the data effectively move between license holders, like products used by healing centers or facilitators working within healing centers? Um, and will compliance create an administrative burden that incentivizes practitioners to avoid this pathway altogether, opting to really stay in, in the black market setting? So in considering how to best implement this program, I would urge regulators to use a comprehensive purpose-built software infrastructure at program launch. And this software should utilize best practices in data security, as well as provide a user experience that doesn't burden licensees with undue administrative tasks. Um, I realize that building software can be costly and take time, potentially more than we have before this program goes live. So you might consider opening up a request for proposal to meet these requirements by the deadline at an appropriate cost. Just thinking ahead, we need to be able to answer the questions of the program's impact safety and efficacy to inform policy in Colorado and beyond. Uh, the way we capture information will greatly impact our ability to answer these questions. Our friends in Colorado, um, or I should say our friends in Oregon, unfortunately didn't prioritize this work when they rolled out their similar program last year. Um, so I urge us not to make the same mistake as we implement this program in Colorado so we can be a responsible example for our community and other states and jurisdictions who will want to learn from us. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll just comment briefly um, that we appreciate that and we will look into how we as we engage in other rule uh, work group sessions like this, how we are um, just overall with some of the questions that may not, we're not like directly answering in the moment. We recognize that and some of it we're trying to hit on what we can in this stage, knowing that some of the, a lot of this is still under development. And so the questions, even if we're not addressing them in this moment are really helpful to informing our agenda and what we're hitting on in later sessions where we have an interest in proactively looking at what did we not address? How does that inform our presentation of a, of a future round of rules and how we're providing clarity on things that we are hearing or themes and questions we're getting. Um, there are data collection requirements um, in the law and that I understand focuses on available data. So it's um, I think less a matter of like mandating new information be collected, though that may um, also touch on certain things that were um, hit on in the comment, like record retention requirements. What sort of things are our rules needing to uh, mandate certain records be maintained on the premises of any of these facilities? Um, and, and how does that inform the why that we're giving you all on? We see this as important in a proposed rule to to require that these types of records be maintained for our inspection if we need it. And what is the reason for that? And so that's something that we will look to hit on as we go forward. Um, and also there are confidentiality requirements in place that we are already subject to within the Department of Revenue that includes if we disclose certain information that's deemed confidential, we could be subject to criminal charges. And so that's another layer of protection that means that we need to ensure we're taking measures as we look at how we intake and manage information that we are that we have accessible to us. How are we protecting that information appropriately? And so we take that really seriously. Um, and also when it comes to uh, opportunity for request for proposal, recognizing um, the we're as a cash funded agency needing to 
um, sustain operations based on application of license fees, um, that there wasn't any specific funding that was allocated associated with some of you know, additional projects that we may contemplate um, that may require additional funding. So those are things that we are considering now. What do we see going forward? How does that inform um, other funding needs or the time um, and like what time would it be appropriate that we could look to explore those sort of things if we see needs for a certain um, contract type um, relationships and support to, to carry out certain things. Um, and that's another reason why we're really focusing this initial rulemaking on what is required under the law to get this initial implementation in place, having lessons learned from the experience we have in Canvas as well as what Oregon's doing. So we were really sensitive to all of that and looking to get ahead of issues and, and consider best practices that we've celebrated, but also lessons learned um, from things that we've already done. So really appreciate um, that insight and, and understand that we're, we're approaching it with that in mind. We'll go next to Josh Kappel. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Josh Kappel. I work with the Healing Advocacy Fund and I'm a partner at Vicente LLP. My comments here are my own. Um, two comments on the definitions. You know, one at first is around the community impact plan. You know, a unique issue as it relates to regulating natural medicine is a desire from a lot of companies to give back to the communities that have held these um, practices and these medicines sacred. And, and they've been doing this through different indigenous reciprocity efforts, through benefit sharing, through benefit honoring, all sim similar names for the same effort of companies giving back to these, you know, indigenous groups or those who've been keeping this, you know, this <clears throat> um, traditional knowledge. And so I, I bring all that up because, you know, I'd like to see the community impact plan extended to acknowledge reciprocity efforts by by you know different businesses as well. Um, so just changing the definition to include you know benefit sharing and reciprocity. This also would be in line um, you know with the Nagoya Protocol, you know which sort of mandates benefit sharing, even though the U.S. isn't a, a signatory to it. And then in um, then in statute, the Natural Medicine Advisory Board is also supposed to document reciprocity efforts as well. So, you know, having this as part of the community impact plan, I think would be a really good step forward and acknowledge, and, and acknowledge the uniqueness of this industry. Um, and then second, on the employee licensing definitions, um, you know, you know, I understand that the future conversations around, you know, potentially different license types um, around healing centers and the like, but we've been hearing a lot about, you know, people wanting to use a license premise temporarily for a healing center, but maybe not full time. And so the idea might, so I guess the, the request on the employee licensing types would be to, to require an employee license if they have unrestricted access to the license premise that that currently contains natural medicine and not just unrestricted access to a license premise overall. Um, so thank you very much. Those are my my two thoughts on the definitions. Thank you, Josh. Okay, we're going to um, take one more comment on this section. Uh, that's so that we can make sure we get through all of the material today, but we'll certainly continue calling on folks who have signed up, um, even if we have to call on them later to talk about these sections. So we'll go next to Bia Campbell. Hi, Bia Campbell uh, with Yes Strategies. I have uh, three comments. The first one is on section 1025 uh, of the rules on page four uh, related to the employee license. Uh, it's kind of similar to what Josh was just talking about right now. Uh, if you look at the second sentence, it says any person, any natural person who who has unrestricted access to the licensed premises. Uh, I think twofold. I think first one, we should create a definition of licensed premises, uh, as well as a definition for a restricted uh, access area of the licensed premises that is where. Uh, the natural medicine is cultivated or stored. I agree with what Josh was saying that uh, the employee license should only be required for folks that have access to that unrestricted area. Uh, just because like we're talking about, you know, uh, healing centers uh, that can have multiple uh, people uh, coming in and out and servicing uh, unrelated uh, services to the natural medicine. And I don't think those people should be required to have an employee license. And I think more importantly, uh, it also brings us to uh, rule 2125 on the premises information, uh, 
uh, if the NMED is going to be requiring uh, the possession, right? I think it's important for us to break down the uh, register, the restricted area from the licensed premises. So that's the first comment. Uh, then the second comment is on rule 2130 on page 14. Uh, and that would be uh, related to the, sorry, are we not doing that now? Keep going. Okay. Uh, to the reinstatement, uh, I was just uh, wondering if we should add a provision there that brings the what we did for the cannabis last year on Senate Bill 23199 about the approval delayed by local jurisdictions. I think we can, you know, save us some self, uh, some headache in the future by already inclu including that. And then last but not least, but in my opinion, the most important one is on 2160, uh, last page of the rules, page 22, letter D, uh, uh, that at least one facilitator license required in each healing center. And then we are asking that MED um, strike the last piece of that sentence. Uh, no natural medicine healing center may operate without at least one licensed facilitator and then make a period there and remove who is also holds an owner license. Uh, that would mean that any and all healing centers have to have an owner that is at least one owner that is a facilitator. And we disagree with that uh, requirement. We think that those two things can be separate. The owner of the license of the healing center should always have a facilitator that is uh, in the premises and that is providing the service, but the ownership requirement should not be um, uh, tangled with the existence of a facilitator on in itself. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Bia. And just to hit on a couple of things, uh, I think it's a good example of what we're um, also encouraging around the range of feedback that um, we, we welcome. And one example is just what Bia hit on of, you know, actually giving sort of editing suggestions in the moment that we can take back. Um, and also touching on what uh, Josh Kappel and Bia just did around the employee license requirements and how we're, uh, how we, how the current proposed rules inform the scope of that and the feedback being around the unrestricted access to the licensed premises, but maybe for example, we can consider, would it be more appropriate to say unrestricted access to natural medicine as opposed to um, the premises generally and uh, to address some of what we heard where we're hitting on, you know, understanding what the issue is, we have context and we were getting a suggestion um, uh, around what would resolve the issue that has been raised. So appreciate all the feedback we've heard so far. Okay, so we are going to uh, move on to our next section. We will pick our queue back up to where we left off. So if you signed up for uh, to make comments on this first part, we will come back to you uh, to make sure that you have the opportunity to share your comments. So we are going to shift now to talking about owner licenses, as well as employee licenses and financial interests. Um, under the Natural Medicine Code, the division is responsible for licensing folks who own healing centers, as well as the employees who work there. In this section, we're looking at rules 2115, 2120, and 2135 on pages 8, 9, and 16. The initial draft rules require each owner of a natural medicine facility to be disclosed and licensed. Similarly, under the draft rules, any employee who handles natural medicine must in, obtain an employee license. As you'll see in paragraph A on page eight, an employee license is not intended to include someone managing records or a front desk at a healing center. However, we really are looking to focus this on those employees who have unrestricted access to natural medicine. This differs from Oregon's model where everyone in a natural medicine business must have a license and we think there's an appropriate middle ground balance here between requiring licensure so that we can ensure that those who have unrestricted access to natural medicine are doing so in compliance with the rules and law. Rules 2115 and 2120 on pages eight through 10 include similar base requirements to obtain either an owner license or an employee license. Those requirements include paying fees, submitting fingerprints for a criminal history background check, which is required by the law, the applicant is at least 21 years old. The applicant is compliant with any required child support payments. And the applicant is not currently an employee of a natural medicine licensing authority and has not been um, in, within the previous six months an employee of the state licensing authority. 
all of these criteria are required by the Natural Medicine Code or required by other areas of law, for example, in Title 24 and Title 26. The additional requirement um, or expectation of owner licensees that's also included in the code is that a, an owner license applicant must demonstrate compliance with timely filing and paying taxes and curing any tax delinquency. In Rule 2135 on pages 16 and 17, the draft rules lay out the initial qualification criteria for obtaining either an owner or employee license. Where we are looking to keep things simple, clear, and narrowly tailored to mandatory qualifications that are expressly laid out in the Natural Medicine Code, um, we also recognize that there is this expectation in the code of running a criminal history background check. As we work through the background investigation process, our goal is to establish rules in a process where there's no mystery around what it is we are looking at when determining an applicant's eligibility to hold a license. Because the Natural Medicine Code simply states we must conduct the criminal um, history background check, but does not mandate what those checks must or must not include, we look to other, area, other areas of the law for a place to start. In paragraph B on pages 16 and 17, the crimes we have identified as a starting place are, or rather criminal history factors from a bill that was introduced this year seeking to limit criminal disqualifications for license types. While that bill hasn't yet passed and is currently proposed wouldn't apply to um, the Department of Revenue, we thought it was a reasonable starting place and, and agree with the intent of that bill. Lastly, in both rules 2115 on page nine and 2120 on page 10, We've included provisions specifically for potential facilitator licenses. Facilitators working in healing centers will also need to obtain either an owner license or an employee license with our division. And that'll be based on the facilitator's scope of the involvement with the facility. For example, owning and operating a healing center versus contracting with someone else who owns and operates the healing center. Under our draft rules, a facilitator will not be required to submit a full owner or employee license application. So while we anticipate a certain form or a process um, for facilitators, it'll be much simpler to avoid unnecessary duplication of work and burden on a facilitator who's already gone through the licensing process with our partners at DORA. And because they will have gone through that licensing process, we're not looking to impose additional fees for the owner or employee license issued by our division. And I want to note here, if a facilitator applies for a natural medicine facility, facility license, for example, when a facilitator wants to own and operate their own healing center, this will require a full business license application and the required fees. So next we're going to uh, talk about financial interest and then we will start our public comment um, section again. So we'll look at rule 2140 on page 17 regarding, regarding the disclosure of financial interest. The Natural Medicine Code prohibits a person from holding a financial interest in more than five licenses. However, it does not define what a financial interest is, so that's what we're seeking to do in the rules. Our draft rules allow us to begin this conversation, including the expectation that A, all financial interests are disclosed, and B, what is and is not considered a financial interest. For example, a lease or promissory note may not be considered a financial interest. Taking from our regulatory experience in other areas and what we've learned through our listening session, as it relates to varying sources of funding where we have historically required disclosure of all sources of funding in the application process, these initial draft rules do not require applicants for a facility license to disclose all of those sources of funding for the operation. Instead, we are proposing those types of records be maintained by the applicant or licensee with preparedness to make them available upon request as we see need. So again, we're trying to start with a simpler approach informed by our streamlining efforts in other programs. And I'm going to turn it over to Ross Hugerhide to talk more about uh, financial interest. Thanks, Allison. So I am Ross Hugerhide. I am one of the attorneys with the Colorado Department of Law representing uh, the Natural Medicine Division. Um, an important distinction in natural medicine rules is that we do not distinguish between controlling and passive beneficial owners based on percent of ownership. Um, this is a distinction from the cannabis space for those who are familiar with those rules where there is a distinction based on percentage of, of uh, ownership. Um, 
This is in part because of the necessity of ensuring compliance with the limit on the number of natural medicine business licenses a person can have a financial interest in, and in part an attempt to keep uh, the natural medicine rules simpler than the marijuana rules. Uh, we also attempted in the uh, initial draft rules to streamline disclosure requirements while still obtaining uh, the agreements that we've historically seen where uh, there has been an undisclosed ownership or financial interest in a regulated business. Uh, so the agreements that we have suggested uh, should be disclosed initially include leases, promissory notes, intellectual property agreements, management agreements, and insurance policies. Uh, what we've historically seen is each of these agreements independently uh, would not rise, uh, likely would not rise to a financial interest, but where an individual or an entity uh, enters into multiple of these types of agreements with the regulated business that could uh, then rise to the level of a financial interest or ownership. Um, and so that's why we've initially recommended uh, those agreements be disclosed. Um, uh, in uh, again, you know, the disclosure would be for the potential for review uh, by the division and uh, possibly additional follow-up, but not uh, saying that any of those agreements in and of themselves uh, are going to rise to a financial interest, uh, but it's necessary for vetting for those to be disclosed. Um, not sure if anyone had any uh, anything else to add on the financial interest before uh, turning it back over for uh, comments or uh Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate um, the additional context, Ross. Um, and before we go into our next round of public comment, want to hit on a couple of things. One example that um, Allison touched on is the mention of child support payments and compliance there. And I could see some people asking, like, why are we why are we talking about that? Um, and that's where, as Allison hit on, there are other areas of the law outside of the Natural Medicine Code that apply to a number of divisions: the Marijuana Enforcement Division, Liquor, Gaming, Racing, and uh, other agencies where there is a, it's human services, code, right? Um, where there is an expectation that, and coordination that occurs between our departments around things like child support um, requirements. And so that is where that comes in. It is a different area of the law that we need to make sure we're acknowledging here and wanna be transparent about that expectation in our rules that this is something that we need to be looking at based on another mandate in the law. Um, also, um, is we touched on some of the rules and how they're, they differ from what we have done in the cannabis space is we are actively engaging in streamlining initiatives, um, looking at our uh, marijuana rules um, in the regulated space. And so that is an area we know there uh, is legislation has evolved over time, um, over many years, like 10 years with our adult use program already. Um, there have been a lot of changes every year. And that means that every year we're doing rule making and changing rules and creating new ones. And so with that, we see how there is always an opportunity for us to look at rules that have been in place for a while. And what, what have we learned since then? Where can we simplify and streamline things? And so with that work that we that's actively underway, what are we also doing in this space when it comes to taking all those lessons, what's worked well, what needs to be streamlined, and how is that informing the work that we're doing here and saying, let's start here in the simpler space and then see how what we learn and how we might need to adjust as we go. Um, so I wanted to give that context. And then finally, just kind of a side comment, not specific to what we've heard um, yet, but as we continue to engage in conversations, um, and look to distinguish between what we're referring to as the regulated space, regulated natural medicine, and distinguishing that from what is happening outside of that space. So where we hear terminology um, like um, the illicit market, the black market, or unregulated market, um, we have seen over time um, how to that terminology is used evolve, where you will hear us more often um, using uh, illicit or unregulated instead of the black market. And so just want to put that out there as we continue conversations. Thank you. All right. So um, just recognizing that we have been talking now for 80 minutes, I would like to go ahead and take a quick 10 minute break um, to give folks a chance to grab some water, collect their thoughts. Um, and then at 1030, we will jump right back into public comment and push through till noon. So thank you all very much. We'll be back here at 1030.
All right, welcome back, everyone. So we are going to open up public comment and um, focusing on owner licenses, employee licenses, financial interests that we just talked through, but also welcome comments on the first section that we um, started with as well. And as we noted in the chat online, we're going to start with in-person comments. So um, anyone who wants to make a comment in person, please come on down. Hello. Hello. My name is Andrew Bond, um, principal of Original Meds, medicinal extracts, dealing with functional mushrooms and things. And there's some corollaries, obviously, to play into this market where very curious to get involved. Um, so representing myself, uh, these are my comments. But my biggest question really right now relates to uh, how, why is it that it's, so you're looking for efficiencies, for example, like if you're co-locating multiple licenses, how is there some ways to maybe streamline that process, whether it's inspections, renewals, fees, whatever. I, I love that idea. And I think there's a lot of merit there. Uh, related to that, why is it that the testing facility portion is separate from the others? So if I were to get a license as a testing facility, it would preclude me from getting licenses otherwise or vice versa. Can you explain the rationale behind that, please? Sure. I can touch on some of it, but looking for input from others, really ultimately seeing that and taking um, that from our experience in the cannabis space as a conflict of interest um, a type of issue that can be introduced if somebody is operating their own testing facility while also operating these other license categories where there are requirements for testing. And so um, our, our uh, marijuana rules do address that in various ways, uh, including like even if there is that independence um, when it comes to like retesting requirements uh, that may involve you not use the same um, laboratory under certain circumstances. But ultimately, that's what it is looking to address are conflicts that can be introduced related to the dual um, ownership. And if I could, Ross Ugerheide with the Department of Law, this is an area um, where we have been very engaged on the cannabis side um, with testing cases and testing issues. And I think the way I describe it is, you know, the testing labs are the gatekeeper. This is not federally regulated. This is not, you know, the FDA is not looking at this and the labs are going to be testing for contaminants, stuff that is injurious if you consume it. And so we really do need that separation of an independent lab saying, yeah, you don't have things that are going to harm people if you consume them. Um, and, you know, to avoid the uh, really that conflict that, that can't be resolved, where if you're the business doing the testing, you're saying, yeah, I want to test. I want to pass my stuff so I can pass it on to consumers. And there may not be that real independent third party testing uh, that is doing the public safety gatekeeping. piece. So I, I do think that's important. And um Hopefully that helps explain why why that is uh, contemplated in these rules. Certainly, yeah, and I, I've heard some different uh, dialogue and whatnot related to level of you know how onerous testing could be in multiple stages of a product life cycle or where it's at in the supply chain, things of that nature. So maybe there's you know the third party safety testing or there's COAs you know, to make sure that those uh, contaminants aren't being passed to consumers and ensuring safe products 100%. Uh, but when it comes to these potency elements, maybe right before packaging or something where it could be packaged with a, uh, you know, an oxygen eliminating type packet or something to reduce oxidation and potency loss so that that product could then be packaged in a, in a smart way and then be certified sealed at that point, let's say, before it went to a healing center or facilitator. Um, you know, to reduce some onerous, because I was thinking efficiencies and essentially like, so maybe there are certain testing elements that do make sense for a manufacturer and product business. Uh, something to think about, because I think it can increase efficiency of the process, the timeline and supply chain, so that the most potent, most quality, fresh ingredients can get to patients sooner, while also reducing costs in the process, not having every test piece have to go out of house to third party. So I'm not trying to overcomplicate that, but maybe there are some shades of gray in what those testing elements are to create, create some efficiencies to keep the you know cost of medicine appropriate for the folks who need it. So. If I could ask maybe a follow-up question, um, Ross, we were having with the Department of Law. How do you avoid the in-house testing become testing to compliance? And so what I mean by that is we test it and we say, oh, this has got something that's uh, dangerous uh, when consumed as intended. Let's do this process to remove it. And then uh, 
you know, it's still not safe for human consumption. We'll do something more. And we don't know what the uh, process is. And it may not be something that's tested for. It's not a solvent extraction or something that's permitted under the rules. And then we say, all right, we've now passed for microbials. Send that to the lab, get my passing test. Good, we're good to go. And then that process that wasn't tested for involves things that are may or may not be permitted uh, under the rules causes uh, harm to public safety. And so how do we, uh, I guess the question back would be, how do we balance that? Uh, what I think is kind of quality control in-house testing that you're suggesting against a uh, testing into compliance challenge. And I know this is not the testing forum. We don't yeah, have that's, the that's appropriate June, testing June. folks. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, great point. And I, I do think the public health elements related to contaminants could be a certain type of test. And I think potency could be another type of test. What types of alkaloids are present and what and things of that nature. But again, testing equipment, it's also very prohibited to own in-house. It is a specialty thing. So I understand that fully. I'm just trying to think if maybe there's some way to create some efficiency in some of the steps related to testing once the um, you know contaminant issue and public safety elements are addressed. So. Thank you for your comment. And yeah. I do want to highlight further that um, we have a whole day yeah. set aside to talk about testing. Um, we have a whole day to talk about cultivation and manufacturing practices. And we have a work group, a separate work group to talk about packaging and labeling. So I think the questions that um, Ross put forward are, are kind of a good insight for everyone to see. These are the questions that we are trying to tackle as we prepare for those work groups and encourage everyone here to also think about those questions and, and other questions that we may not be thinking about right now. And please submit written comments because that will really help us as we develop for those future work groups. Appreciate you sharing your context and where you're at with it now to help with that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Martha Montemayor, HC Mushrooms. You all know me. I have sent in written comments on this many times. Do I need a license to microdose? So I guess I can kick this off here and look to others to contribute. I've written new letters on this. <laughs> well, and, and just to be clear, we're still developing the rules and we aren't going to have answers to all of these as, you, as we, this is our very first rule make, official rulemaking work group. And so okay. some of these things we just have to recognize, we're not gonna have answers until we continue to go through this process um, and assess sort of what the range of options are based on the law. Well, and I've been trying to keep you informed on what I'm doing as well, which is we are doing uh, medically supervised microdosing, where the microdosing is not in clinic though. It's we are giving education and advising patients on microdosing for personal use at home, for self-administered personal microdosing. Um, so far so good. And I just, you know, I've been very upfront with what we're doing. But I also want to say I definitely agree with Thea that it should not be a requirement that one of the facilitators, you know, if, if the whole thing goes away because a facilitator misses, God forbid, a child support payment, and then you lose six different facilities because this because that was your facilitator who was, quote, on the license, you've lost care for a lot of patients that way. And that seems a bit unreasonable to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just comment on uh, a couple of things related to this one. As we uh, encourage uh, written comments, continue to be submitted. We want to see that from you. Um, we are not responding to every written comment that's submitted. Really, what it's doing and where what's most critical at this stage is we have, um, and we're targeting before the moment that we need to be beginning to take applications and issue licenses, which is at the very end of December, where really the schedule that we set out is trying to get rules adopted and in place well before that date so that there is um, ample time for preparation for those who want to go through the licensing process. So our focus is on seeing how those written comments inform our drafting of rules that we're then presenting to you all. So we're trying to use our time with that specifically in mind and prioritizing that, recognizing that that may mean we're not answering every question that you have in a public comment. Um, and really that's because we know that people are eager to see final rules so that they can prepare for those next steps. So that is how we're prioritizing our work. And then as we continue with uh, presentations of proposed rules, where there are opportunities for us to address questions that have come up, we're gonna look for that opportunity so that we're um, being responsive as much as we can. And also when it comes to certain things that are um, issues around compliance, like the child support example, that is something that is required under the law. Um, that said, 
Um, if, there, if we identify a compliance issue, just like we do in our other regulatory work, we, we look to identify opportunities to get folks back into compliance. It's not like you're done, you're finished. And so we are gonna be considering situations, aggravating and mitigating factors, what steps have people taken to try to um, demonstrate that you know, this is not a willful and deliberate action, that there are issues and that they're working towards compliance. And we have every interest in seeing folks, if we identify a compliance issue, get into compliance so that um, people can continue operations and we can continue our regulatory work. And of course, there's a due process. There's a notice um, requirement and opportunity for hearing, opportunity to resolve issues that we're bringing forward. And, and that includes opportunity for conversation. So um, we're gonna be approaching it uh, with that all in mind. Yeah, thanks, Dominique and Alice Robin at Natural Medicine Division. Just want to add to that to really emphasize something that Dominique had said at the beginning that we're saying throughout all of our meetings, which is this initial rulemaking, we are focused on those mandatory requirements in the law, which is to license and regulate cultivation facilities, manufacturing facilities, testing facilities, and healing centers within the, the com, within the confines of the natural medicine code. And so that's where we're focused. Again, we've built in time to allow folks to prepare to meet those baseline requirements. And we fully anticipate this being an iterative process with multi, like with rule makings happening in the future. So um, this is those base requirements that we need to, in order to stand up this program. Come ahead. Hello, Red, uh, Skip Mitter again. Um, this is uh, back on 2140, we, we talked a bit about uh, intellectual property uh, one thing I think that should be included in there is uh, you have brands that will be coming online. You know, I wouldn't call it intellectual property so much as, as like a trademark. There may be formulations behind that um, that are included. So it may be a financial interest. It may not. But just as things unfold, brands are going to be coming online. There may be uh, uh, you know, licensed individuals, you know, that, that have a, have an interest in anything like a, a Paul Stamets or something, right? Uh, that that should be something acknowledged under 2140, just how you, how you acknowledge brands, you know, uh, intellectual property, when it becomes a financial interest, maybe it's a flat fee for licensing something. I know you, you just state that it's not necessarily inclusive, you know, in 2140, feels a bit vague to me. I think having more just black and white scenarios to make it easier for people to know what to do as this launches, like round one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Aaron Lyman. Uh, I just wanted to show concern about the child support issues. If you can remove a license based on the payment of child support, like uh, um, last lady had said that a support center can lose its license based on that. I think it needs to be maybe uh, more of a uh, forgiveness to that, where if you do get into um, a problem that you have the ability to pay it off or set up an agreement with the state, uh, but there needs to be probably a leeway time, like six months, if it's something that's like, okay, half of the amount of time that it's going to take. But then also onto the land ownership. Uh, basically, land ownership and financial interests have nothing to do with each other on the caregiver side or any of the licenses that we subject. Uh, the financial interests behind land ownership are basically the income from the rental of the property. Uh, there should not be a limit on five owning, say, five properties. It should be a, a limited amount of properties. Now, if that individual owns a license, then owning license five properties, sure. But uh, if there's real estate income trusts that own thousands of marijuana dispensary properties. And I assume that this is going to be the same as well. Um, I'm just putting that out there as a financial interest for the financial community that the ownership of the land cannot and should not be limited by licenses. If I could, uh, yeah. Ross Ugerheim with the Colorado Department of Law, um, it's a founder state there. I just hoping to clarify 
we are saying those interests individually are not a financial interest. So just because you're a landlord uh, to a natural medicine uh, facility, that does not make you a financial interest. Uh, historically, however, we have seen where one individual has all or most of those agreements, and then it becomes, wait a minute, who really is the owner? Is it the disclosed person who has applied for the license, or is it really the landlord who's also the secured lender, who's also the intellectual property holder, where all the economic benefit of that license goes to someone who isn't identified as the owner? So, um, you know, I think maybe we can look at further how to clarify that at rule, but really intending to say, that alone, uh, you know, being a landlord does not mean you have a financial interest. And, and exactly to that point, to uh, not prohibit, uh, you know, a real estate trust or a real estate company from lending, uh, from leasing to, uh, you know, multiple natural medicine businesses. So I uh, appreciate the comment. Uh, wanted to provide, attempt to provide the clarity and, you know, happy to relook at the rules on, and how we can maybe make that even uh, clearer in the one thing that I might suggest is if the real estate income trust uh, worked with the companies that they uh, were leasing to, to uh, provide partial ownership of the real estate income trust, then they would actually own a small amount of the uh, facility, the, the building that they're operating out of and have mutual interests, but not the other way around where the real estate interest would not <laughs> have interest in the actual business itself, but the other way, the business having interest in the real estate. So, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Andrew Bond, Original Med, speaking on my own behalf. Um, just something that's come up was, uh, you know, the five licenses that was mentioned and what we just reviewed. And then there's also language on um, pay, at the top of page 19 under 2150, basically saying, uh, to ensure that a licensee is not operating in multiple locations under one natural medicine business license. And for some of the comments I'm hearing, it sounds like there's, I'm, I'm hearing it is if I'm only a cultivator, for example, and I have five locations, I need five separate licenses, one for each location, and that maxes me out. So I, I want to make sure I'm hearing that correctly. And then also if I'm a cultivator, but also a product person, there's two licenses there. Maybe I'm co-locating those in two locations. Okay, so I've got four licenses, two locations at this point, leaves one open. But is, is, am I reading that correctly though, that there's a maximum of five and they are tied to each specific location, meaning I can't be licensed to cultivate but have six locations, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and so just to restate, looking at um, the limitation in the law around um, five licenses, and that's based in Senate Bill 290, um, that we're looking at that on a license by license basis, even if you have a co-located facility with two licenses. Um, those are still two licenses that are touching on, you know, the limit of five. Um, so we're looking at those individual licenses. And then Charity with Colorado Teletherapy Services. I saw a question posed on page five regarding financial interest for publicly traded companies and just wanted to speak to that. And, um, you know, when I first read that, I thought, wow, that didn't even cross my mind because all of these conversations are so local, you know, within the state. And when we look at the original Natural Medicine Health Act, the statement at the beginning was that mental health services within the state of Colorado are not being met. And that's really the underlying purpose of this entire conversation is being able to bring natural medicine for mental health services in Colorado. And so allowing publicly traded companies, I think would be a conflict of interest in that because we're looking at primarily a for-profit. If you have investors, you're definitely looking at for-profit. You know, all of us here are going to have financial interest, obviously for our own selves, but we are also residents of Colorado, and most of us typically also serve in some other capacity within how those needs are being met for the local communities. Um, so I guess that was just kind of my reflection points as that question was specifically posed and talking about those financial interests that allowing publicly traded companies really takes it out of local communities and potentially away from that original mental health goal um, for the people of Colorado. So I don't know. Thank you. 
Are we online or? We'll take we'll, we'll take one more in Hi. person. I'm Lloyd Cummins. I'm here in Lakewood, and I'm a researcher, particularly involved in the uh, insurability of the industry, and also what we may be doing here, obviously to set rules or uh, projected rules as Arizona, uh, Michigan, Massachusetts. You know what happened in cannabis is they just took our free public regs and stamped Oregon on the front. So we're in a good position and a bad one. Uh, the last speaker talked about public <clears throat> companies and I hearken back to when Governor Hickenlooper in 2017 rejected this very issue of public companies owning Colorado uh, cannabis licenses. And in rejecting it on the, on the uh, Attorney General at the Times recommendation was based upon this theory that cartels are going to come in to Colorado if public companies were allowed to come into Colorado. So I don't believe there's any tie between those two things. And in fact, if you look at the current landscape in psilocybin, the companies that are at the FDA, the companies that are in the Netherlands, the companies that are in Australia, <coughs> who are serious about research and developing this psychedelic model for the whole world, are mostly public companies. So we have this, again, a disconnect. Are we gonna put Colorado at a disadvantage for investors who are gonna be wary of the whole industry to avoid Colorado when they could put their money here, their experts here, and we could become more of a leadership base rather than following what someone else does in Massachusetts two years from now or California in a year. So I would really, like to recommend that the rules that are placed upon public companies are duplicative of those placed on our local companies. Uh, and then secondly, on this area of uh, licenses, previously I've indicated I thought we need a, uh, in, in other hearings, we need to involve the FDA universities like CU, CSU, extending it over to uh, University of California, New York University, Johns Hopkins, of course, our state should have a license for researchers. And this is very controversial because it has nothing to do with healing centers, mycology, or testing. What it has to do with is allowing academics to touch these natural medicines, touch. Because touch is the beginning of actual clinical research. And if we're going to require them not to research in our state, Again, I think we're advocating leadership. Uh, last point on uh, licensing is consider retreats, health centers, uh, other public areas, other private areas to be minimally licensed so that that location can be a temporary place and not be involved with all the rest. But someone that says, I wanna have our uh, 16 acre place qualify somewhere in Vail, it should be allowed without them coming all the way into the industry. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, a couple of things I want to hit on and want to invite um, uh, my colleague from the Department of Law, Ross Figurehide, to add anything is, um, you know, we've heard a couple of comments around the question that we posed and uh, in the proposed rules around uh, publicly traded company involvement here. And um, Lloyd, I think teed us up nicely by mentioning one of in prior years in the marijuana space, there was a, uh, in the prior administration, um, a veto of a bill um, that was uh, allowing for publicly traded company ownership and investment. And the law um, previously, when the uh, marijuana laws were established, there was an express prohibition for publicly traded company ownership and investment in marijuana businesses. Um, now, after that veto occurred, there was another bill that did pass that expressly allows for publicly traded company ownership and investment in marijuana businesses. And that's um, House Bill 1090 from 2019, I believe. Um, yes. So the very following year, that bill did pass um, and opens it up for publicly traded company involvement and investment. Um, and to other comments we heard um, that, it, the extent to which there is an allowance in our rules um, you know, as we look to evolve these rules, there is not a similar in the law prohibition for publicly traded corporation involvement like there was in the early years for marijuana. 
Um, and so that's why we need to be contemplating these things now, because there is not an express prohibition, there is not an express allowance. So we need to determine how does that inform um, additional requirements or disclosure requirements or, or limitations um, in place in these rules. Um, the last thing we want to do is just turn a blind eye to it and not say anything because we see in other states how, and from the cannabis experience, that their involvement could still be occurring from publicly traded corporations. So what are we doing to deliberately address this in our rules and identify what that means for application, disclosure, other requirements, and what that means as far as limitations that need to be put in place. Um, the, the expectation is whether they're involved or not, that um, services still are within the scope of the state of Colorado, that everything is still happening in the state of Colorado. Um, and also when it comes to any sort of residency type limitations, um, while the law does um, identify some like prioritization um, uh, related to our application review, um, we, there is no, there's no um, restriction in saying you have to be a Colorado resident to have one of these licenses. In fact, when we've seen this in the cannabis space in other states, it gets challenged successfully um, based on uh, where courts are landing on that. So um, that's another area that we would not want to just tee up a legal challenge by suggesting that there be a, a residency requirement because it is actively, there's enough information and, and trends that are showing that if we do that and we get challenged, we will not be successful on that. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, Ross Ugerhide with the Department of Law. Just one, one additional thing to add um, in response to the, the prior comment. It is not possible to apply the same application and disclosure requirements to a publicly traded company as to an LLC with one or 10 or 100 owners. It, it does not work. We know this from the cannabis experience. Publicly traded companies can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of shareholders all over the world. And so to say you have to disclose all owners for a publicly traded company does not work. We know that won't work. And so if we do allow uh, publicly traded companies, there will have to be differences in the disclosure vetting requirements for those public companies that differ from a, a small uh, or, you know, a privately held company. Um, it just, the, the rules cannot say the same things apply for private and public companies. And we know that from our prior experience in the, the cannabis industry. Okay, we're going to go online for comments and we'll start with Erica Messenger. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. Um, first, I wanted to say that um, I just really appreciate this entire team. You guys have are incredibly organized. Um, you've done a phenomenal job of gathering this information and engaging the public and creating these draft rules uh, since the division was formed in September. So I just wanna say uh, big kudos to you all. Um, my comments, uh, I'd like to second the comments already made by Josh Cappell, Bia Campbell, and Michaela Bo. Hey, Erica, oh, Erica, you got really quiet on us. Uh, okay. I don't know if you leaned away from your mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, you're good. Okay, Thanks. great. Thanks. Um, so my name is Erica Messenger. I'm a registered nurse specializing in rural health in Colorado. Um, I've also had the honor and privilege of serving as a non-voting participant for the Emergency Response, Safety, and Ethics Subcommittee of DORA's Natural Medicine Advisory Board. I'm a contributing mem member of the University of Colorado Anschutz Psychedelic Public Policy Partnership, or PPPP, and my comments are my own, and I do not speak for the Natural Medicine Advisory Board or the PPPP. Um, my first comment is I second the comments already made by Josh Kappel, Bia Campbell, and Michaela Vote. Vote. Number two, 2125A2C, um, the security and surveillance of licensed premises. The licensee is or will be entitled to possess and secure storage. Thank you for covering this, Dominique. I second the comments made earlier about secure and safe storage of documentation in paper, digital, and video format. Um, additionally, um, sorry, let me grab my comments here. Um, on 2125A2B, um, where it says uh, about being uh, applicable zoning laws for cultivation manufacturing. Um, and also I believe it was a thousand feet from a school um, uh, for facilitation services or a healing center. I recommend an allowance or exception for facilitation services conducted in home for those are 
who are physically unable to leave their home due to disability and end of life um, services such as hospice. And then lastly, um, the healing center, uh, this page 12 to a, um, the ceiling healing center application that says information demonstrating the applicant will be employ or contract at least one facilitator. Um, so I submitted similar comments during Dora's draft rules for co public comment session. Um, my concern is that there's an omission, omission of a secondary safeguard during an administration session for the protection of both the participant and the facilitator. Um, so in the, in the spirit of participant protections, it's not outside the realm of possibility that psychedelic therapy facilitation may be a strong attractant for potential predators. It renders a participant essentially vulnerable and unable to advocate or defend for themselves. So I recommend having either a chaperone as well as uh, one facilitator or um, presence of a secure video monitoring system to protect both the facilitator and the participant. Thank you so much for allowing me to comment. Thank you, Erica. Great, we will go next to Jason Weiner. Good morning, uh, my name is Jason Weiner. I'm an attorney practicing law in Colorado. Uh, I, I'm here speaking on my own behalf um, I have just submitted written comment. Uh, thank you for making this opportunity available. I wanted to provide a general comment with respect to uh, owner licenses, financial interests, and uh, premises. It's my view that there will end up being a somewhat fluid dynamic between the personal use carve out for bona fide therapeutic services uh, without public advertising and the licensed uh, regulated regime. And I want to encourage consideration in this rulemaking to broaden as much as possible access to uh, the licensed regulated marketplace for services, um, either for someone who may start out uh, using licensed uh, services and then end up using uh, the services available under personal use or for uh, business models that may uh, be a somewhere in the middle of the two systems. Uh, it's my belief that public health and safety is best served by giving uh, the, the public access to both and a choice between both on as similar terms as is possible uh, from a cost and access perspective. Um, and it would be especially beneficial to public health and safety if uh, the same types of bona fide therapeutic services uh, that are permitted under the personal use exemption um, can find provenance and feasibility in the regulated licensed sector as well, um, not by necessity, but simply by choice. Um, and so I've made comment with respect to uh, community-oriented um, consumers who may form cooperatives and other associations uh, to procure healing services, whether they be um, event style spaces or uh, whereby they may hire licensed facilitators for uh, temporal use. Again, my comments are specifically provided in, in the written form, but here today I'm, I'm uh, just proposing a broader consideration uh, to look at the uh, perhaps a permeable line between the personal use services and the uh, licensed services available. Uh, thank you for your consideration and appreciate this opportunity. All right, next we'll go to Sean McAllister. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to chime in. I'm Sean McAllister with McAllister Law Office, and we are helping uh, therapists, licensed uh, professionals, and other practitioners try to get into this system here. So very interested, just making comments on my own behalf. Um, and yeah, nice to see so many uh, cherished colleagues and friends uh, on this rulemaking and longtime associates. So it's an honor to be a part of this process. And I look forward to positive rulemaking for the state of Colorado. Um, a couple quick comments and questions. Um, 
one, going back to a comment earlier today about uh, obviously delivery services aren't allowed, but the law did contemplate in-home uh, facilitation. Uh, that's in Senate Bill uh, 290 under 1270-105, CRS 12-70-105. So it talks about facilitators providing services in healthcare facilities and private residences. And I just haven't heard uh, much dialogue about this. This is an important part of the law that we drafted to uh, address in-home care and palliative care situations, or just as the commenter said earlier, people that are uncomfortable um, doing the work outside of the residence. So I, if I missed it, I'm sorry, but I hope we will get rulemaking on that important provision and expand the um, opportunities for doing facilitation outside of healing centers. Uh, I guess also wanted to mention that I'm a little confused by the financial interest definitions. And I think we need to be clear. What I remember is that the law said no individual can have more than five licenses. Uh, I think the law is a little ambiguous as drafted right now. It needs to be very specific to it, uh, the, the provisions I saw should probably say something about individuals cannot have uh, five licenses. And, and also we need to drill down into entities to see who owns those entities. I, I think that's the intent, but I feel some uh, clarification could be done to that definition and rule. Um, I also agree there should be a pathway for public companies, although I don't anticipate a lot of those are trying to get into the system. Um, but I think we need a comparable process to what we have in, in cannabis and it should also uh, live up to the spirit of a limit of five licenses. Um, we did see a lot of shenanigans with cannabis in terms of finding ways around residency restrictions. And it looks like the rules are trying to address that and they contemplate some of the creative uh, uh, thinking that people have done in the past, but uh, I think we should be careful uh, to give meaning to that five license limit and not allow lots of ways that people are dragging money out of the system that ultimately amount to profit interests um, as a way around that five license limit. So I know I'm out of time. The, the last question, just to clarify what Dominique said, I think she said the five license limit is per license type or maybe I misunderstood that. So could somebody own five healing centers, five cultivation licenses, or is it a cumulative five license limit? Thank you. Thank you, Sean, uh, for your comments and for being a part of this process. We'll come, uh, respond to your question and hit on a couple other things. Uh, and what I meant was it, it cumulative. So all licenses, that's my understanding of how it was intended to apply. Um, so that's the intent here and, and appreciate just with the feedback you provided, I think it just reflects the beauty of this process and where we have a starting point with proposed rules that we, based on the feedback we're hearing and suggestions that we're gaining through this um, process, these conversations that we're having, as well as in the written comment process, how, how we can refine those rules and um, based on your own suggestions or the comments that you're giving us to, so that our team goes back and says, okay, what did we take from this? Um, we go back and listen to the recording, we read the comments, and uh, we see what does that mean for updates that we're making to those rules that ultimately inform that evolution um, of our development of rules before we go to that final, final hearing where we're presenting the final proposed rules, that last opportunity for public comment before we then take this package um, of final proposed rules and um, present them to the state licensing authority, the executive director for the Department of Revenue, who will assess um, and direct potential any changes and assess um, when those rules are ready for final adoption. Um, the, uh, there was mention of the, yeah, the allowances in the law there around healthcare facilities and private residences where facilitation services can be provided. That is something that um, I acknowledge, I believe um, the team will correct me on this, if not, that it is not reflected in our proposed rules at this stage. And that is uh, a reason for that is, we see that is, uh, and we want to make sure we're continuing to coordinate with our partners at DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, but we see this as more in the scope of the type of rulemaking that they will likely be hitting on as they continue through their process, um, because we're not talking about those facilities. I would um, suggest then when we're talking about healthcare facilities or uh, services that are being provided by a facilitator at, at a private residence, that we're not 
looking at those as um, particularly private residents is a healing center type license. Like, uh, so that is what we see is more within the scope of what facilitators um, can be doing, the allowances and limitations and how that's addressed in DORA's rules. But as we continue this work um, and recognizing there's um, multiple agencies uh, engaging in this implementation process where we're likely to see some overlap and questions that we need to work together to address and determine how we uh, might need to touch on some of those things in our goals that we're gonna keep an eye out for that and, and continue that, that work and may look to revisit some of those things. Yeah, thanks, Dominique. I also have met with the Natural Medicine Division. Just wanted to add to that, that this topic of authorized locations other than healing centers um, has been one that the Natural Medicine Advisory Board has been grappling with, and they have not yet made those final recommendations. But um, I anticipate that those conversations will continue at the Natural Medicine Advisory Board about what that could look like. And really, to Dominique's point, informing what a uh, facilitator is permitted to do under DORA's rules and certainly we'll be tracking and coordinating as necessary. Sorry, Ross, we were having the Department of Law. Uh, one clarification on the financial interest uh, discussion. Appreciate that, uh, Sean. Um, however, uh, we are pretty stuck because the statute says a person may not have a financial interest. The statute also defines purchase person as a natural person or entity. And so I don't see that we have the ability to uh, further define financial interest as limited only to the individual and not to look at the entity as that would uh, conflict with statute. So I uh, did want to provide that clarification, thanks. Okay, great. Well, I'll take one more comment from an online attendee and then in the interest of time, we'll move on to our last section. Um, again, we'll pick up our queue right after that section to continue the comments. So we'll go next to Mike Knott online. Mike, are you still with us? Yes, apologies. That was, uh, I was, I do not have a question. I, I thought I was filling out the sign in. Okay, great. Well, um, glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Great. With that, we'll move into our last section. Great. So I'm going to take us through the last section, which is priority application review, location requirements, and local jurisdiction compliance. The Natural Medicine Code includes some required considerations for prioritizing application review. These requirements are included in Rule 2125C on page 13. Our initial proposal to fulfill these mandates, which we expect to evolve over the course of the rulemaking proceeding, include prioritizing applications that identify one or more owners who have a <clears throat> traditional tribal or indigenous history with natural medicine, identify one or more owners who are veterans, and include a community impact plan demonstrating that the natural medicine business will be located in or serving rural communities, the natural medicine business will be offering discounted or free natural medicine services, that the business has sustainability measures in place to minimize negative environmental impacts from the cultivation, manufacturing, testing, storage, distribution, transport, transfer, and dispensation of regulated natural medicine and regulated natural medicine product. This is just our starting place, recognizing we heard comments in our listening sessions, both supportive and not so supportive of requiring all licensees to submit a community impact or social equity plan, and urging us to think about what accountability measures will be in, play, in place for impact plans. So we feel like this is a good place to start the conversation with more tangible rules in front of folks. And as we've discussed, the Natural Medicine Code includes requirements and restrictions on where natural medicine facilities may be located, and give lo gives local jurisdictions authority to modify those restrictions as part of their time, place, and manner regulations. The base requirements in the code and reflected in the rules in 2125 on page 11 include that the applicant is or will be entitled to the pos possession of the premises. The proposed license premises complies with local zoning laws or the for the cultivation, manufacturing, testing, storage, distribution, transfer, or dispensation of regulated natural medicine. The proposed location is not the same location as a license or permit issued pursuant to the liquor code or the marijuana code. And if the application is for a healing center, the proposed location must be at least 1,000 feet from a child care center, preschool, elementary, middle, junior, or high school, or a residential child care facility measured by walking, not as the crow flies. And as we continue with our 
implementation work, we are thinking of ways to help applications, applicants across the information that they need about their local jurisdictions in order to attest that their application, that they are in compliance with local laws. And in addition to these initial application requirements for natural medicine businesses um, and the licensed premises lo locations, we proposed Rule 2150 on page 19, a process by which after obtaining the business license, a licensee can move the location of their facility. This is informed by our work in the cannabis space and recognizes that sometimes licensees need to be able to adapt their operations. In order to change locations, we will require an application. This is so we as a division can fulfill the statutory requirements related to location requirements and confirming compliance with local time, place, and manner requirements. And this rule includes expectations that the license licensee does in fact move their location and does not operate out of both locations at any time. And finally, in rule 2110, 2125, 2130, and 2150, in order to obtain and maintain a license, licensees must be in compliance with any local jurisdiction, time, place, and manner regulations. Okay, so we, um, this time we're gonna change it up and we'll start with online comments. And we will go ahead and start with Carolyn Holland. Hello there. Um, my name is Carolyn Holland. I uh, work as a certified registered nurse anesthetist. I also am in the CIIS program to receive certification as a psychedelic practitioner for research and therapy. And I have a question and a comment. My question um, includes the requirements for facilitator licensing, specifically 22.2 .2 on pages four and five, B1, um, then B and C. Um, the 40 hours of supervised practicum training that is proposed and also the 50 hours of consultation over six months plus all of the details about the requirements for consultation. And so right now, um, Oregon is the only state really where psilocybin is being used in legal healing centers. And so it seems to me that that would mean that potential new facilitators in Colorado would need to go to Oregon for the 40 hours of training and 50 hours of consultation. And I was curious if there were any um, collaboration between the Natural Medicine Advisory Board and the state of Oregon to help facilitate practitioners to do this training and consultation work. Um, and I was curious about whether or not there was a precedent for how the 40 hours and 50 hours were suggested. So that's my question. My comment is that I also, I was happy to hear Nico Skivaski's comments about data collection. And having worked in anesthesia in the United States, we really have been limited to looking at critical incidents in anesthesia that are based on closed claim studies. So we don't have a really clear picture of how many anesthetics are done um, in the country compared to how many cases lead to a complication or a critical incident. And so I was curious if the Natural Medicine Advisory Board or DORA were considering a mandatory data collection um, for psilocybin administration so that we could document any adverse events or critical adverse events that, that occur in the future. So thank you very much for this forum today, and um, I appreciate all your hard work on this topic. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I, I appreciate your comments and the questions you raised. Unfortunately, we don't have the answers to your specific questions. Um, that would be the Department of Regulatory Agencies rulemaking, our partners at the Department of Regulatory Agencies who are doing that facilitator licensing and regulation. We don't have authority over facilitator licenses um, at the Department of Revenue. So appreciate your comments and questions. I know our colleagues at DORA are listening in today. 
and would encourage you to um, submit those written comments to Dora so that they can consider it in their rulemaking. And also um, appreciate the comments and want to address further your question around data collection. And there, I mean, this is a conversation that will continue as we noted earlier, we'll also, you know, as we develop rules inform what sort of things um, we see as um, necessary to propose as a requirement for certain um, record retention um, and, and data that um, should be maintained by um, as somebody operating any of the facilities in the space of so the Department of Revenue is responsible for licensing and regulating. Um, so that's your healing centers, cultivations, manufacturing facilities, and testing laboratories. Um, now, the uh, Senate Bill 290 also does include separate data collection mandates, uh, and that's based on information that's available. And so it's uh, less uh, what we see is a, less of an approach of we need this data to now you know, to be collected, it's what information is already available and being collected to inform what we're compiling and to try to get ahead of um, some of the lessons learned in the cannabis space is where is there value in having baseline data in areas, what's available and where might there be opportunities to collect information um, to inform that baseline data that's helpful to understanding what are the impacts of this program as it's implemented. Um, we did not, um, have as much progress on that in the early stages of our um, standing up our marijuana program that led to some challenges. And we've made significant progress since then, but um, you know, challenges including the potential for perceptions that um, aren't you know, something that's not an outcome that's not tied to the regulated market, the regulated space uh, might make it easier for somebody to look at some data points and still suggest that it is tied to an implementation of a you know a regulatory program like this. So that's why that baseline data can be really valuable for everyone. Um, now the, the law does require um, collection of, or data collection and reporting around law enforcement incidents, adverse health events, as you had touched on, that's another area we're gonna be looking at. Um, consumer protection claims um, and, and other areas that are outlined directly in the law. So um, we'll, that'll be another area of implementation that we continue to explore. Thank you. We'll go next to Mark Ross. Hi there, uh, Mark Ross here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. This is um, a follow-up to the comments I've previously made during the listening sessions and submitted to the department um, with regarding the ESG criteria that was in the original Prop 122 and uh, is now codified in uh, CRS Title 12, Article 170, Section 104, subsection 6A11. Um, I've noticed and um, uh, that there is no mention of technically ESG criteria, and it seems that the department has tried to address that requirement through the community impact plan. Uh, so my comments are threefold regarding community impact plans. Uh, number one, in the definition section, I think, again, I think it's it's great that the department is taking a look at requiring or at least providing for guidance with regard to community impact plans. They don't seem to be required, but I also want to distinguish between ESG criteria and community impact plans. Again, ESG criteria would typically be environmental, social, and governance metrics um, that are collected around those three areas. Um, usually the way I see them um, it's in SMART metrics, SMART goals, SMART being strategic, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time barred. Um, I think the way that the department has defined community um, impact plans may be unnecessarily conf confining because when you typically have a company looking at their ESG criteria and goals, it's highly dependent on the scale, size, resources, program, programs and uh, and location of the facility. So not all facilities um, um, may require, uh, say, a remediation uh, of a community impacted by the war on drugs uh, or be able to even address those issues. And not all operators may be able to help lower barriers to healthcare. And so while I commend the, the department for suggesting those two elements as being potential community engagement plan uh, practices and proposals. Um, I think they're a little too confining for every operator and it should be broader. 
I've also noticed my second comment is with regard to this community engagement plan, all it seems to do is allow for priority review. It's not mandatory in section 2125. Uh, similarly, comment number three, it seems that these community engagement plans may, may be considered with regard to expediting renewals under 2130 uh, and not are necessarily mandatory um, as was contemplated by the original act and submitting ESG criteria. I appreciate your time and I'm happy to uh, uh, provide these comments in writing if it would be helpful. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for highlighting um, some of those aspects of the community impact plan that um, we, you know, our intent here is to start that conversation. So really appreciate your comments and, and would lo love to see some written comments on this too. And we do not want to make this a confined or restricted um, set of necessarily factors or, or only things that a applicant could look at. What we are intending to do as we continue to develop and that these rules evolve is look to um, set some of those baseline expectations and rule, but really through guidance and other uh, resources build out, you know, so that a business can tailor their impact plan to um, what they're doing, where they're at and who they're serving. So appreciate your comments today. Hey, thank you. And just to add to that, we'll continue to look at just and appreciate the feedback that you've provided in the listening sessions. And um, today is uh, your mention of how you're interpreting the ESG criteria be applied, what should be mandatory, how does that um, separate, how is that separate from what we have proposed um, as it relates to the community impact plan, so that we can continue to think through that and see how that informs future, you know, our ongoing development of these rules and other sections we may need to be building out. Great. We will go next to Natasha Poinsat. Um, hello, thank you for uh, having me on. My name is Tasha Poinsat. I am with the Healing Advocacy Fund uh, in Colorado. And um, I want to, first of all, just say I agree with Bia Campbell and Joshua Kappel's comments, as well as Mickey Bott from earlier today. Um, Regarding the comments about the employee licenses, I just wanted to add a little bit more context around why uh, we want to make the case for not requiring employee licenses in situations where they won't be handling of natural medicines. And specifically in our outreach, we've gotten a lot of inquiries from people who are wondering if they can have a business or possibly um, also a, a healthcare location where natural medicine services could be offered. So a facilitator could come and facilitate at that location, uh, but not necessarily store any natural medicine product on site. And um, we think that this, you know, is worth considering as a way to create more flexibility for those different location types who might not include natural medicine services as the primary uh, sort of service that they're offering, but do want to make it available to certain patients when it uh, would fit their needs. And so just encourage consideration of that, broadly speaking, and then also with that, not requiring necessarily uh, employee licenses for people working at those locations in the event that there won't be natural medicine stored on site, or um, potentially also considering whether there could be a threshold below which uh, the license wouldn't be required. Um, or yeah, flexible arrangements along those lines um, for locations that, that want that sort of flexible approach. Uh, and then um, I also wanted to comment on this require, proposed requirement for an owner licensee at each healing center and agree with Bia's comments that uh, it is probably not a good idea to include that from the launch of the program. What we've seen in Oregon is that there are a lot of barriers and challenges that these businesses are facing economically, trying to get started with uh, federally scheduled once, of course, substance, um, and then a host of other uncertainties. And adding that requirement could add substantially more expense, especially for some of the smaller operations where somebody might just be an owner who's um, you know, running this small healing center also to then have to invest in getting trained and licensed when they might not have the time or capacity to actually function as a licensed facilitator, uh, given all of the demands of starting up a business and the fact that, you know, everything we've learned is that being a facilitator is 
a really substantial investment of time, energy, uh, emotional energy. And so it just might not be appropriate to expect people to hold both of those roles, at least from the onset of the program. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to comment on some of that before we go to our next um, uh, public uh, comment is, uh, is was presented, just want to clarify and make sure we're clear on the expectation of facilitators. If somebody's licensed as a facilitator through DORA and say that facilitate that individual with a facilitator license also wants to come to the Department of Revenue and open up and operate their own healing center. Um, that we are seeing needs for a, a full application. You're paying the fees process for that operation, for the facility. Um, we also see a need to have you go through that owner license process, but what we're looking to do, because if that individual has already been licensed, paid a fee, gone through the process with DORA, we're not looking to impose a separate owner license fee um, in this case. And so that's where we're sensitive to the investment that's already involved, the, the steps that that individual took through DORA, that we're not looking to double down on that unnecessarily if work has already been done. But it's important for us as we are regulating these operations um, to have a jurisdiction in order to, if there's a need to take action, um, to have the person operating, owning and operating that facility to also be licensed. So we have jurisdiction over that individual as well as the um, operation. And so that's really, it's about the scope of jurisdiction based on our regulatory oversight and uh, where in the extent to which we see a need for action where we see it as appropriate to, um, for that to include the person who's owning and operating that facility. Um, but again, not looking to double down on fees in, when it comes to that owner license. So it would be a more streamlined process knowing that a lot of bases have already been covered by DORA if they're licensed as a facilitator. I appreciate that. And I just wanted to clarify quickly, I was more referring to the requirement that at least one owner also be a licensed facilitator, um, that that could create uh, more of a financial burden, especially for some of these smaller businesses. That's great. Thank you for that. Great. We'll go next to Jerica Perez. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Thank you. Jericho Perez, partner at Vicente. Um, my comments are my own. I'm jumping back to financial interest and owner. Um, I, my comment is that the definition of owner as it reads right now is over-inclusive um, to include every financial interest um, as financial interest is currently defined. And so not, so every owner could, is a financial interest, but not every financial interest should be an owner. I think if we include every financial interest as an owner, it's going to be overburdensome on the department. It's also going to deter business and investment in the program. Um, I think it should be the owner definition should be revised to include include anyone who holds an equity interest. Um, as it stands right now anyone with a financial interest would be required to go through the background checks, all of the due diligence, and be, would be liable and responsible for all actions of the business licensee. Um, and with a federally illegal substance and program, I, I think investors and business is going to be deterred for that reason. And I think we can still require disclosure, disclosure of all financial interest without having to go through this owner due diligence and background requirements and meet the definitions of the law that pro or the requirements of the law that prohibit a financial interest in more than five licenses. Thank you, Jericho. Okay. I'm gonna take a quick pause here to see if there's anyone in the room who was hoping to make a comment on the last section we covered of the draft rules. And if not, we'll go back to our online queue. Okay, great. Um, we will go next to Bia Campbell. Hi, uh, Bia Campbell, VS yes, Strategies. Uh, first, I want to uh, say how much I agree with Jericho's comment just now. I hadn't thought about that, but I really liked her way, the way that she put it about, you know, was uh, amending the definition of owner and separating the financial interest. I think that makes a lot of sense. It would cover the 
uh, statutory requirements for the financial interest and who can have the licenses, but would also, I think, even be easier for MED from like an application processing standpoint to define and uh, regulate those owners. Uh, and then uh, to piggyback on what Dominique and Tasia, I believe was her name, I apologize, apologize if I'm saying it wrong, uh, were discussing before. I think, Dominique, we are in 100% agreement with you about the uh, need for those facilitators to be regulated under door and have those licenses, as well as for if those facilitators have their own centers to also have an owner license and have a license for that facility, right? I think there's some debate there, but we can put that on the shelf for a second. Uh, what we are uh, saying here is just that because of 2160D, uh, the way it reads right now, uh, we are also required that any license that is a uh, healing center has a necess necessity of having a uh, facilitator as an owner to be in operation. And I think that's the part where maybe uh, we would like to see uh, uh, amendment to the current draft rules. I am submitting all of this in writing to you guys, uh, hopefully in the next couple hours uh so i think it explains really well but we're just it, we're, we're just seeking like a little teeny tiny change to clarify that thank you bia and this is um and a really good example i really appreciate everyone pointing out that language in 26 2160 d our intent was to require a healing center to employ or contract with a facilitator we did not intend um, for that language about a facilitator also being an owner. We recognize some facilitators may want to be owners. We want to give space for that. Well, we also want to give space for facilitators who want to work in a healing center that they don't own. So um, really appreciate you honing in on that language and giving us that feedback because that um, what you all are suggesting is consistent with our intent. Top of page 12 on 2A has the language you're saying. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. So I have a comment. I just wanted to put it out there that you're regulating, you're creating rules for the regulated space, which means half of the space is unregulated. I would encourage the board or committee or whatever you're calling yourselves now to create a system that's going to make it uh, enticing for facilitators and people to want to get into regulated space, um, not over, over uh, create a whole bunch of rules and laws that people don't want to get into regulated space, because there's also that option too. So I'm just putting it out there that uh, please don't over-regulate us that want to comply and want to uh, provide the best service for our people. Um, and the safest service, because really I'm here because 90% of it, it needs to be safe. The other 10% is the, the service that we're providing. Uh, what, what needs to happen is the regulation needs to cover the safety aspects, not necessarily why we need to comply with any of the laws and regulations uh, of rules. Just putting that out there for the board as you guys make your rules and regulations make it enticing to us. So we want to comply. I'm sorry. And can you state your name? My name's Darren Lyman. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. And also if there is any suggestion that you, any area of the rules you see that you would consider over-regulation, we want to know specifically what it is that you're talking about. That's what's most helpful to us to understand uh, where we should be focusing on refining rules just based on the feedback we got, seeing a need to clarify some things. And that's just a part of the rulemaking process. Um, uh, also want to be clear that we are not a board. We are the natural medicine division. We are staffed with the natural medicine division within the department of revenue. I know there's the natural medicine advisory board appointed by the governor, um, that Dora, our partners at Dora facilitates. Um, but we are the ones who are really administering this rulemaking process. We are drafting the rules and bringing them to you, um, to collaborate in this process, to inform the ongoing development of this process. Um, but we are not the final decision maker on these rules. We're really looking to collaborate as we develop uh, and do that work um, to then tee everything up in a nice pretty package to send to the state licensing authority, our executive director for the Department of Revenue, who will be officially determining what is adopted. Great, we'll go next to Michaela Voigt. Sorry, please let me know how to pronounce your last name. 
It's Vote. Vote, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Michaela Vote. I am a uh, provider in private practice um, and also a member of the um, public policy partner, psychedelic public policy partnership. My comments are my own and don't reflect any greater group. Um, I'm just more, I think, requesting clarification on um, what delineates between needing to do the applying for an owner's license or a natural medicine business license um, and kind of what dictates which is more relevant if the person applying is wearing both hats of owner and facilitator. Um, and then I'm assuming also that if the owner and facilitator are the same person that that person is not also going to be required to apply for an employee license. Yeah, I will start us off here. Thank you for your comments and questions, Michaela. Um, so to put this in a little bit better clarity, um, the reason we're saying a facilitator may will need either an owner or employee license is so that um, the Department of Revenue, National Medicine Division, and State Licensing Authority have jurisdiction over that individual and the conduct um, on the licensed premises. And so that is one of the reasons and where we are suggesting a facilitator may want to obtain an employee license is because they are simply providing natural medicine services, maybe on a contract with a healing center. To your other uh, question about the difference between an owner license and a natural medicine business license, part of the reason for this distinction in the license types is based on the code and the requirement to issue these licenses as well as on that requirement that we've discussed earlier related to the financial interest and that um, for us to be able to evaluate who has the financial interest in national medicine businesses, we're looking at the owner license as one avenue to do that. Um, Dominique, do you wanna add anything on the business distinction? I'm sure just to hit on a couple other points here. Like if I am a facilitator licensed by Dora um, and am looking to provide services, as Allison mentioned, in a healing center, um, then and say I'm contracting with a, a, the person operating a healing center and that healing center is um, licensed by us at the Department of Revenue. Um, we would see in that contract arrangement, the facilitator um, it, at a minimum getting an employee license um, as a part of that arrangement. If that facility, if I as a facilitator want to own and operate my own healing center, then I need to go to the Department of Revenue and also apply for an owner license with the Department of Revenue that is tied to your, um, your healing center um, operation license. Um, so there could be a scenario just as well, say I as a facilitator want to um, work in, not own and operate, but work in a cultivation or a manufacturing facility. That would be more in that category of an employee license that we would say in order to do that, if you're going to be handling natural medicine, then you need to get an employee license with us. So those are some examples that we'll look to see because the feedback has been very helpful and how we need to um, continue to look for um, opportunities for more clarity in those rules. So as it's written right now, um, if I am a, if I want to have my, be the owner and facilitator, and I'm, but I'm working within my own, like I'm owning and facilitating, would I be applying for both an owner's license as well as a natural medicine business license? Yes, because there is one, in, there's an in, like natural person license for the owner. And then I am operating this business, this, I, this facility, so that that is a separate facility license. And so you would have both. Got it. Thank you. You get charged for the owner license if you're also a facilitator. Okay. Okay. We have time for one more comment. So if there's anyone in person, we've worked through our queue online. Go ahead. Chair, you excuse me, the Colorado Teletherapy Services. I just have a question regarding the dual licensure for facilitator and owner as far as fees, because you mentioned if you already have a facilitator license with Dora, then Department of Revenue will not charge a, maybe I, I kind of lost my thought because now I'm thinking through it, it sounds a little different because you out loud. You mentioned the Department of Revenue would not charge the owner license fee. Right. Okay. Does that also go the other direction if you are already an owner? And this is a question, I guess, to Dora, but I don't know if this came up 
in your conversation with them if you're already an owner and then you finish the facilitation uh, requirements because that's a lengthier process that they're still kind of piling through right now too do they not charge the facilitator license fee if you have already paid an owner fee to your partner representative so i'll share um that i that's a question for Dora to address, but I also just, I wouldn't, I, because of the requirements that Dora's rulemaking has the initial proposed rules, knowing that those are also not final, um, based on the list of requirements for facilitators and the work that goes into that process, I would anticipate um, that they would likely still have a fee that would need to be imposed as a cash funded agency because of the additional steps that would be required for facilitators, whereas for an owner license, it's going to be different um, for somebody going through that owner license process through us, um, whereas the DORA requirements are um, pretty in, in depth and, and, and based on the recommendations of the board and the, what's reflected in the law around this, that we would see that as um, you know, likely a distinction from how we're approaching it. So wrap that one up first and then try to get the owner license to, if you're going to avoid a potential fee somewhere. Possibly, yeah. But well, I mean, recognizing these rules are still yeah, getting worked out. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one more before we close out? Yeah, we Just have briefly. We have exactly three minutes, so okay. before we need to start closing. Thanks again for all your work on this. Uh, administratively, you said today that uh, Dora continues oh, to monitor what we're doing. Please introduce yourself. Oh, Lloyd Covens again. I'm Princeton Research. Uh, last Friday, um, we were. Uh, gathered together for a, a DORA sponsored rulemaking or not pre rulemaking as you're doing today. And uh, we were not provided access visually to the conference. Sometime during the conference, many of us asked so we could identify people by their name, uh, by their face, what they were saying. And we were told during that session that DORA does not require Zoom meetings to contain the video portion. Ross, do you have any information on that? Uh, Ross, we are out of the Department of Law. Uh, I am not gonna be able to provide legal advice uh, regarding what uh, Dora uh, may or may not have done. Um, probably would be- well, I'm not looking for legal advice. Well, that I'm was simply nope. saying that in this process for the last year and a half, I think it's been very transparent. And it may not seem like a three hour meeting with no visuals, except for that clock, which was on the meeting, uh, no people. For instance, we were asking, who is this gentleman that uh, testified from Jamaica? They said, look look at the recording. Well, this is two hours and 15 minutes into the recording. I'm sure he either has or uh, is able to be found, emailed, contacted, but what you're basically saying is once a meeting commences, the 75 of us in the audience expecting to participate are on an audio meeting, which is technology of uh, 20 years ago. Again, Ross, we were hiding with the Department of Law. Um, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, uh, you know, I can't answer a question uh, as to whether a different agency complied with rulemaking requirements or not. It's not something that I could. Well, it wasn't real making. It was a public. <clears throat> so, public. thanks, Ross Allison, from the Natural Medicine Division. Just um, appreciate your comments. Uh, every department has their own policies about how they run their meetings. This we choose to run our meetings in a format with in-person and virtual attendance. Um, but not every department does it that way, and that's absolutely fine as long as they're still complying with the Administrative Procedure Act requirements. And so. Um, appreciate your comments and uh, encourage you to share those with our partners at DORA. Do you have an online last question? Uh, when you referred from the natural division, you guys, over to DORA, you might want to look at this. You get the full, complete DORA website from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So there is no natural medicines link. And I'm afraid the public who knows even less than we do is going to be very much confused over this problem we have. DOR, DORA, mm -hmm. uh, Natural Medicines Advisory, Natural Medicines Division, Natural Medicines, as the media looks at it. It's very confusing. And I would hope that IT could, could help us out in the next 
year? Uh, Shannon Gray, Natural Medicine Division. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, I do see on our website that we link directly to the Welcome to the Natural Medicine Health Pass homepage on the DOOR website, not the DOOR website generally. So if there's from today's notice uh, on our website directly. Uh, so if, if it's something specific to today's notice, we can look at that. But on our homepage, we have referenced directly. I don't know that that was always the case. So I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, we, we will look at that. Thank you. Thank you. So we need to wrap this up. Uh, appreciate all the comments today. Um, and we recognize that our um, agency partners are listening in and we work closely with them in this process. So we'll certainly ensure that we continue to have conversations around how we're, as we're building uh, new web pages, new websites, as we're continuing to develop new materials as a part of this full implementation, um, we're always looking to assess how can we improve on the things that we're doing based on feedback we're hearing. Um, teams are also resourced differently. So that's going to impact how you know we go about these things, but always with an interest in transparency and uh, of course, ensuring that we are hitting all the steps we need to um, legally in the rulemaking process. So we appreciate all the feedback we've heard. Um, you know, thank you all for attending today, both um, in person and um, all of our attendees online. Uh, as noted, really just uh, expressing a lot of appreciation for the feedback that we've heard, the participation we've seen today um, in this process of creating these new rules for regulated natural medicine. Um, as always, we are going to be posting our materials from this work group meeting and a recording of today's meeting on our website. Um, we're going to look to do that within 24 hours, but I'm really looking to have that done by the end of this week at latest, um, but we're usually really all, all on top of that. Um, this is also a good time to flag, particularly for any of our new attendees in this process. Um, our website includes a place where folks can subscribe to receive updates from the Department of Revenue's Natural Medicine Division. Um, signing up helps ensure that you're receiving all of the latest updates about our implementation work and upcoming meetings that we have. Um, so please check out our website and consider how you want to leverage and receive information about our work. Um, I know we're going to include, uh, include a link to the chat, um, in the chat to, to this. Um, if you did not get a chance or were not ready to provide comments um, in today's meeting, uh, as we noted, there are going to be many additional opportunities in future rulemaking meetings like this. Um, and there's also going to be a final hearing on July 25th where we're taking all the information that we've gained from the series of work group meetings, rulemaking meetings that we're having to come up with our final proposed rules that we'll be presenting and providing that final opportunity for public comment to inform what final rules we're then sending to the state licensing authority. Um, additionally, we encourage anyone with information, perspectives, uh, proposed rule language to submit written comments using the division's written comment form. Our next rulemaking work group meeting is uh, April 10th and that's from 9 a.m. to noon. We have another public stakeholder work group scheduled um, that April 10th, where we're going to uh, cover general requirements, uh, which we anticipate will include topics such as uh, licensed premises requirements and health and sanitary requirements as just some examples. Um, details of that work group meeting uh, will be made available online on our division's rulemaking webpage prior to that meeting. Um, before we close out today, I uh, also want to share, we have developed a survey to gather more information about who's considering applying um, to us at the department for a license to operate a natural medicine facility. Um, this is really helpful to us, uh, getting our arms around the scope of participation we can anticipate in this space. Um, we ask that anyone who is or may be interested in applying for a license in the future to fill out the survey. Um, and I know we're dropping a link in the chat. We'll make sure that that's also available on our website and we'll look to see where there's value in just sending a follow-up email for those who are subscribed to get updates from us. So you have all those materials accessible. Um, and then for folks in person, all links shared in the chat, as we noted, will be um, in the slide deck that we're posting online. So take a look at that slide deck where you can get all those links. Um, all right, thank you so much again for being here and being a part of this process. We look forward to continuing our work together. We have concluded this meeting. Thank you, thank you so much.